All right, we're back. Chains and robots here for this season of GSL <laughs> Code S. Uh, we are here in Group B. We already finished up Group A. It was actually an incredible set of games. Oh, yeah, that final game, too. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't watched the VODs yet, but you do not want to miss specifically the last map of Group A was just one of the best games that I have personally seen in a very long time. You know, at least my favorite game this year. <laughs> yeah, I'm for sure this year. Honestly, I mean, I've done over, what, 12 years of GSL. That was one of the best games I've seen. I really enjoyed it. I think Group B is going to be a delight as well. Um, and I'm just excited to get this going here. Um, you know, this GSL, we have had to downsize a little bit. We are only 16 players, so we go through these four groups. Uh, and we rapidly move over to the finals. No studio audience, by the way, uh, if you're watching and planning on coming down and seeing this, with the exception of the final day. Yeah, and the final day should be exciting, too. We're going to have semifinals and finals. Yep, all super live, tournament style. One night, live audience, back in the GSL studio. I'm looking forward to it. I cannot wait to get there and see which players are going to qualify, who's going to show up here in the first season of... Uh, GSL this year. Yeah, and um, so if you're watching from home, don't come down to the studio. Unfortunately, we did have some people that came in yesterday, and they had some sad looks on their faces, and we told them we could not have an audience. But um, yeah, yeah. And if you're watching online, uh, for the best viewing experience, go to the URL below. That's on the Africa TV website. I think if you're watching on YouTube now, uh, it's like there's a frame around the picture. So if you don't want that frame. Uh, go to that URL down there. Got to uh, break free of those chains, man. Those, those YouTube th these chains. chains <laughs> the same chains these that are chains right are a us. metaphor <laughs> for you looking through that frame right now. So the way to free yourself is to go to that uh, yeah. URL. Um, yeah, and, and as we were mentioning earlier, we've downsized here. We're now relying on community support. It's patreon.com forward slash GSL. Um, there's two ways to support the show. You can either support on the Afrika TV site. That's where you buy star balloons and you donate the star balloons. Uh, think of that as like the currency uh, for the Excite, other uh, the, the, the website, not the Excite, excuse me. Um, or, or you can go on Patreon and donate in whatever currency you're using uh, to support that. And that does come with perks. Yeah, and a lot of cool perks like there. Like $30 tier really stands out to me. I mean, getting replays from the GSL game is actually so cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's a thrill. And you get behind-the-scenes interview videos, player profiles, and... For the champion, of course, secured tickets, guaranteed tickets to the finals. You don't have to worry about those, those selling out. Of course, that is first come, first serve. And of course, all the proceeds from this crowdfunding is going directly to the players. It's going to support the prize pool here at the GSL. And so far in total, almost $9,000 raised across Afrika TV and Patreon. Very cool to see here. Um, so we really do appreciate the support. 100% of that goes to the pros, minus the little percentage cut that Patreon takes. Um, for facilitating that. So uh, we really appreciate the support, guys. And look, this is the way that pretty much everything with StarCraft is going to be for now. Um, <clears throat> uh, by the way, you're going to get your Patreon perks on Monday if you signed up uh, over there. Uh, but yeah, this is this is like the state that we're in um, here yeah. for, for StarCraft, and we're very grateful to be able to rely uh, on community support from people like you. Yeah, the community has stepped up in a really big way, not just here at the GSL, but across StarCraft as a whole, crowdfunding yeah. a variety of online tournaments, supporting the Korean su scene, supporting the global scene. And, you know, it's heartwarming to see because when the news came out that, you know, everything was going to get cut back a little bit. Yeah. Well, this is, you know, this is just, it, it, you know, it's weird because we were used to the old model, but the truth is this is kind of the new model for the whole internet now. Yeah, I guess it is, so. It's kind of community support and, and connecting with fans directly, um, you know, whether you're a streamer or an event or something like that. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's definitely a change from the past, but I think it's also, the truth is this is how a lot of things are going forward. Uh, are going to be not just, you know, the StarCraft scene. So you can see already we've got two Terrans advancing here from Group A. That brings us now to Group B. By the way, our schedule is always going to be Tuesday and Thursday. Right, Tuesday and Thursday, leading all the way up there to the finals. As today, we're going to be having an interesting group, Hero, Keen, Cure, and Solar. Solar now, I think, only the second Zerg remaining here in the GSL Code S after Don Grey Goo was eliminated on day one. Yeah, it's funny because we're having the opposite uh, story for a, a you know ASL where there were so many Zergs <laughs> coming through. I'm kind of weirdly delighted as we've been casting ASL as well as GSL to be like, all right, some less Zergs over here. There's, <laughs> the universe is balancing this out. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, Zerg has been the most successful race in StarCraft II, especially in Legacy of the Void. Um, we've had many, many Zerg champions. It looks like this is a season where that is not likely to be the outcome. I feel like it's more likely we'll see Terrans 
continue to dominate a little bit here in the first season of GSL, but who knows? Maybe some of the Zergs remaining and like Solar here in Group B might come up and surprise us. I mean, Solar last year in GSL had a lot of very good performances, even winning the Super Tournament to close out the year. That was uh, GSL Super Tournament 2, I think, last year. And yeah. That was a ZBZ as well up there against Dark. So, I mean, there really has been, you know, a trend of Zerg success for a couple of years now. and it, It's been a good race. I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of great players playing it, obviously, but also we see creep and we see the power that that gives the Zergs. Uh, we are seeing Terrans and Protosses, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, they've been labbing it out quite a bit. Uh, and I think that's why we have so many good looking um as far as play goes, Taryn uh, and and Protoss play good looking in other ways too. I mean, they're all they're all handsome guys. Don't get me <laughs> wrong. Um, but this is already a pretty interesting season in, in, in that it is not that Zerg lopsided. Um, we could still have a Zerg in the finals. Uh, it wouldn't we, surprise the two me. guys that we have left over. Yeah, there's a lot of talent still left. I mean, I mean, we got two Terrans advancing there from Group A, so we'll have to see what Group B has in store for us today. Is Hero. I mean, one of the players you have to look out for here, one of the favorites to advance from Group B, but boy, does he have his work cut out for him. Solar, Kieran Keen stand on his way from advancing to the round of eight. And I'll tell you what, he wins the best room I've seen so far. That's nice, Look at actually. that nice setup of shelves. He's got Are little those... gamer mice there. Yeah, look at all those mice. Yeah. I, I almost want to make a joke, like, this is what I would expect to see, like, creator. <laughs> yeah. Like, having all the, all the mice. All the, all the, all the dead something. mice from his previous tournament. <laughs> that's so cool that he has, um, uh, it's probably his whole StarCraft yeah. career of mice is right there. And his package has been delivered, which is good. I'm glad it got there over there in the back. <laughs> Little mystery um, box. This is this is fun, though, since they're playing from home. We're like, okay, what's the setup look like? God, you could do some fun ceremonies. You know, having this at home. home. Like, imagine, yeah. like, Hero, like, he wins this group, and he goes out, and he opens up the box, and it's, like, a little trophy for winning group here or something <laughs> funny like that. Like, confetti pops out of That's it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is kind of cool um, getting this glimpse into the players' lives here, seeing where they're playing at. This is another nice room. I like that plant right there by Keen. I think I have a similar plant in my apartment. Oh, it's good to have some plants in the apartment for sure. Um, here we see Keen. Uh, in his place. Now, Keen, look, he's maybe the weakest player in the round of 16. Uh, yeah. He's been around forever, by the way. Yeah, one of I, the OGs. One of the true OGs. I remember the first year of StarCraft II casting this guy. He's been with us. He's stayed strong. Um, and, and the fact that he's in this round of 16 is really exciting. It shows that uh, he can still hang with the best. You know, when we, we have to start to um, reduce the number of players overall in a GSL, uh, you know, a lot of times it's players like Keen we would expect to kind of disappear off the map, but both Nightmare and Keen have managed to qualify. Uh, obviously, Nightmare is out now, but let's see what Keen has to offer. Yeah, going from a 20-player pool to a 16-player pool here, it's impressive that Keen was able to make it, especially only qualifying for Code S, I think, one time last year. But here he is in the first season of 2023, already qualified. So maybe we'll see, you know, a little bit more life out of him this year. You know, as we saw in day one, that kind of, intro video that we had to the GSL that got us both a little bit emotional. Yeah. You know, for a lot of these players, they really want to give it their all right here in yeah. 2023 and give the best possible performance they can. They're not – I mean, of course, it, it's downsizing. It, it always it always sucks. It it's, always sucks. You know, it's it's a necessary adjustment for the situation uh, – the, the situations that can arise that make it possible for the tournament to continue on, right? This yeah. does cost money to put on. Uh, and does require a lot of manpower, and so that was the call we had to make. And you're right, hearing those players kind of talking and feeling like this kind of feels like the end of them, uh, and the fact that they're even more hungry uh, than before. You know, some of these guys have been in GSLs over a decade and haven't won yet. Yeah, from their 20s into their 30s, they've truly yeah. grown up with this game, and it was one of the scary things was, you know, with downsizing like this in, here, in StarCraft, are players going to be less motivated? Is there going to be less competition? But you ask the players themselves, and the opposite is true. They want more than ever to kind of go out here on a high note, give some of the best performance they can here in 2023. GSL is getting ready to go into Neo Humanity here. Hero versus Keen starting things out here in Group B. Match number one, GSL Code S. All right, let's do this, guys. Team one, ready to go. DKZ Gaming, Hero. It's really twisted headphones. Oh, I didn't really notice that. Me. <laughs> I was looking yeah. at the preview monitor watching. It looks like a long braided small beard coming King. off of his chin. Huh. 
I was trying to keep tabs on this little probe that's moving across the mini-map that yeah. our observer will highlight in a moment. Here it is on screen. This was an instant probe scout here for Hero. And for a moment, I was, you know, he, he's had some kind of crazy builds lately. He's played a lot of online cups, you know, in the time period between I am Katowice and then GSL Code S. And he's really been mixing it up in terms of strategy. He's come up with some really zany stuff. So I was thinking we might even see something like a, like a Max Packs opening or a proxy gateway. But no, instead, it's just going to be Hero coming over here to Keen Space as early as possible, being as annoying as possible here with this probe. And you know, against a player like Keen, who, you know, on paper, you're going to feel comfortable coming up against this guy. You know, you should expect to win this match as Hero. Perhaps this choice of early scouting him is just like, all right, I'm not going to be caught or duped by anything here. I'm going to get the guaranteed scout. And if there are no surprises, I will just ride my skill to a win. Yeah, I think he just, you know, he doesn't want to get proxy raxed. This is always true. It's been true even before StarCraft 2, way back in the early days of StarCraft 1. When it looks like there's a mismatch, um, even maybe you've experienced this online where you like, feel like you're the weaker player. You're going up against somebody who's much stronger. The temptation to try to do an all-in is always there, right? That doesn't go around. That does not go away in the top 16 of, of GSL. And so Hero basically deciding, okay, I'm I'm better. Let me just make sure he's not cheesy me. Okay, he's not good. I'm gonna play whatever game I want to come in here with. Yeah. So Hero able to confirm Reaper expand there. For Keen is Hero now just gonna move across the map, go to this watchtower, get a little bit more vision. We'll be able to spot that Reaper coming in. As you know, Keen also might be a little bit curious about what Hero is up to with that probe after it loses his base. But luckily for him, able to find out exactly where it is heading. That probe will get cleaned up inevitably here as Hero is going for his Stargate back at home. Okay, he's going to snipe down that one probe. Stargate's, you know, it's pretty normal, right? Uh, nothing crazy going on just yet. Hero has shown some really wild approaches to the matchup. Um, but the thing about Hero is he's really able to reinvent himself. He does seem to be a player that um, is kind of, you know, we talked about Nightmare a little bit like this yesterday, but I think it's really true with Hero. Um, it, it, it shows itself in an array of different colors in that he really is kind of figuring out his own approach to the game um, without much input from other players. Yeah, you know, when Hero came back, Kratos was in a very bad position. It's actually it's a Phoenix that we have right here. So yeah. you know, coming down that avenue that you're talking about with Hero kind of going a little bit off beat here, not opting for the Oracles, and actually going to let these two Adepts finish. So he's going to try and deny a little bit of mining time. Unfortunately, was not able to pick off that SCV, needing one more shot. Oh, my God. To clear oh, okay. it. He's going to get that lifted <laughs> yeah. up in time. I'm like, this would be the worst thing ever if he just got inside the main. Um, it looks like now the Marines and Reapers are going to have to try to close in. Uh, on the few adepts that are here. Honestly, this is pretty good to basically just deny some mining and then pull away. Great micro by Keen, actually. Uh, the, both adepts do get away. He's been pooling the phoenixes, which means he doesn't want to show the phoenixes just yet because obviously a phoenix is not the first thing that comes to mind uh, in this match, certainly not on two bases like we've had so far. So when he shows these, it has to be at a moment when he's ready to execute the plans he wants to have. Now. We know a lot of Terrans like to do uh, quick drops against Protoss. I mean, I you know, it's not uncommon to have Widowmine drops come in en masse. Uh, and this could be a good way to basically absorb that and shut it down. But we don't have any drops coming in this game so far. Yes, yeah, so these Phoenixes are going to be a little bit sad by not having any medevacs to snipe on their way over into his base. But you know, this is a style that Hero, as of late, has been quite comfortable to play. You know, he often will mix in one or two Immortals and try to use that to bridge the gap from this early game into getting to, oh. you know, a little bit of a Phoenix Colossus composition. Now Keen with that Reaper Scout will confirm that it is Phoenixes. And, you know, if you're Keen, I think you're feeling pretty happy about this. You know, you're not committing the drops, which are which could have potentially gotten caught there by the Phoenixes doing no damage. And instead, you're going for a Siege Tank and mostly Marine composition here to start things out, which has a lot of firepower that can be difficult for those Phoenixes to deal with. Yeah, I mean, when you have nothing but Marines underneath the Siege Tank, by the way, full scout here with this Adept, so he knows exactly what's coming. When you have a bunch of Marines underneath uh, a Siege Tank, the, the Phoenixes can't get in there and pick it up, and the Phoenixes aren't going to be useful picking up Marines either. So this is a setup to have a very strong push that's going to come out here uh, and fight the Protoss. And I'm looking at this, I'm seeing Hero taking a third base. I'm a little bit worried. He might get beat up pretty bad uh, when this push comes out. 
Yeah, we'll see. Looks like Keen now is going to be opting for going for Widow Mines as opposed to Siege Tank. So just the one Siege Tank going to be kind of linchpinning his defense there back at home as Hero has proven time and time again that he is a fearsome opponent to go against in terms of dealing with his aggression. You can kind of see Keen showing a little bit of respect there with his opening builds. And this is one of the features of this map I like a lot, actually, here on Neo Humanity is all four of these cooling towers share the same hit points pool. Yeah. And once you actually knock those down, it's four destructible rocks that not only narrows the gap should you break through on one side, but also closes it entirely for at least a moment. It's a good move there to try to curb progress in a push that would be coming across the map. We obviously don't have that just yet. I thought the push was going to come a little bit sooner, by the way. I was wrong. There's actually a third command center being made here. Um, and, and that's fine here for Keen. I mean, he's still looking to be in good shape, but it also means that the Nexus that's already been taken here for Hero will be gone unpunished. And Hero just going to slowly transition into Colossus. First Colossus about halfway done now, as we have a bit of a slower game right now. You know, Keen, I was also expecting him to be moving across the map a little bit earlier than it seems like he's getting ready to do. But perhaps just doesn't want to try his luck too bad, because if you take a bad engagement against Phoenixes, oftentimes those can snowball in ways that are not favorable for you. Is here, Hero finding a nice window. Actually going to pick off a Widow Mine in two. Marines, so that's a nice catch for him. Good use of those Phoenix energy. Yeah, I mean, he, he needs to get some value out of them, right? Um, the push is going to come down. There is two Immortals and a Colossus ready here. Zealot Charge is far from finished. So um, I, I like the fact that these four Phoenixes are becoming a bit of a nuisance, but I am worried about this push that's coming out here um, and, and how exactly this is going to be dealt with because this is going to be in range to start to shell the Nexus. So basically, Protoss has to come in here and take this out immediately before it can really be utilized. Oh, here we go. Keen charging in right there. Some force fields, you know, buying buying here some time, excuse me, as uh, it looks like he's going to be able to hold on for now. Yeah, he, he kind of baited out the uh, disable there on the Colossus a little bit earlier. Um, I, I got to say, Terran looks scary, but I think when this disable's done, I think the Colossi could start to chisel away at this. The Guardian Shield's going to come down. The Phoenixes do pick up because the Marines are retreating. They're not able to cover that. Um, and I got to say, a very graceful uh, takedown of the push from the Terran hero, not overextending, biding his time. We've got Phoenixes. These could go right into these two uh, medevacs that are moving out, but hold on, they unload right now. Yep, Keen unloading those medevacs, getting ready to take that third base right there. Is you know, losing the Raven and not getting too much value out of it with those disables on the Colossus does hurt him quite a bit. I think that Keen wanted to trade a little bit more cost efficiently there. It's you're hard pressed to actually take out the. Protoss third base in a situation where you're going for a third CC yourself because obviously that's money that isn't being spent on being aggressive, but Hero just being such a nuisance with these Phoenixes, continuously picking off Widow Mines, and if you can manage that going for a Charge Zealot Colossus Phoenix composition, if the Widow Mine count stays down, his army com composition as Hero suddenly becomes way more powerful. I think you're right. I, I do think there's going to be a moment where uh, Hero can now come out on the map and really start to try to do some real damage over here to this base. We have the Terran pushing down. Hold on, these Phoenixes are actually killing up quite a bit of Marines. You can see that he's actually got the count high up enough that he can just start to, to thin out the reinforcements. Um, but here's the push I wanted to talk about. Down at 6 o'clock. Uh, it looks like he might be ready for a fight. Uh, and that might be a great time to come in if the Protoss is leaving. The scan makes Hero think otherwise. Yep, Hero now taking into High Templar Tech. We'll see if he goes for Storm or just decides to mix in some Archons. Is, you know, both options seem quite good with how well he's been able to keep the Widow Mine count under control here. Poor Keen. Keen continuing to move across the map, but so far, Hero's economy largely uninterrupted. There was a little bit of pressure there on his third base, but it didn't disrupt mining time too much. Hero was able to, to dispatch it after, what, 15 seconds, and now he's taking his fourth base. He's starting to mix in some disruptors. He's already gotten, I mean, all of the value you could possibly hope to get out of the small handful of Phoenixes that he made. And I'm liking his position a lot here. I think Keen is going to be hard-pressed to try and find an opportunity to get damage now that Hero is starting to fire on all cylinders. Okay, so the push is coming, and so is this drop. He could actually warp it. Oh, my God. I think would have mind hit there on the warp, uh, uh, the, uh, warp prism. I can't talk. Um, he's going to bring a few more Zealots in. The Terran actually has good instinct and scans right in the middle of the map, seeing the Hallucinated Colossus. There's a counterattack coming down now for Terran. This is gonna, about to get really crazy. Yeah, this is going to be a dicey situation right now as Keen kind of 
Going for the base trade situation here, not feeling confident enough to take on the army here for Hero dead on. And that's going to force a recall. So Hero reinforcing here in the third base. Phoenix is picking up a lot of these units, but these medevacs, they're not oh. going to be able to get away from the Phoenixes. Oh they God. boost, but the Phoenixes are so quick already to get sniped. They're so full, and I think what was a pretty even game up until now is going to go very much in a Protoss direction. I mean, you shut down everything. There just wasn't that much value gained uh, with that drop. And uh, the fact that he's continuously been making these um, uh, Phoenixes has really paid off in moments where he can start to swing the fight. He's also filling in all of his techs. So Hero should uh, pretty soon here be able to actually push out and deny a fourth. And speaking of fourth base, we see over at 9 o'clock, uh, that's exactly where Keen's going to try to expand. So King going for that fourth base, Hero comfortable enough to throw down a fifth one as he's starting to open up these passageways in the center of the map. And you know, I like that idea from Keen. You no, know, he scanned, he saw Hero's army. He's like, okay, I do not want to deal with that coming in on my third base right now. Let's try and counterattack. But he was just a little bit too slow to get out of that situation. The recall came in from Hero, cleaned up absolutely everything. And you know, a 20 supply lead now for Hero means that Keen is not in the best position. And with the Phoenix count as high as it is, too, he just swipes in here, gets seven SCVs. And yeah, there is some hole damage there from the Widow Mine, but Hero takes that trade any day of the week. And this Protoss army is getting so complex, so high tech, that I don't know exactly how Keen is going to be able to try and pull this apart. I mean, he is now mixing in some ghosts, but. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, I think that we're at the point of no return here for the Protoss. I mean, Keen could try to do something, but I think eventually we're going to have this big battering ram of a push. And even if Terran tries to do a drop somewhere, it's just going to trigger a recall. Um, I mean, Hero right now coming in with the classic setup with the big push down here and the small warp prism up into the main to warp in uh, as many zealots as possible. He can only warp one in with the supply that he's got, but I'm sure as his fight continues on, he can warp in a couple more. Keen trying to get the pounce on this army over here at the 9 o'clock position. Will force a couple of disruptor shots. No. There aren't too many zealots warping in here because Hero is max, so he is going to try and pull that warp prism away. He does look like he, it doesn't look like he has shuttle speed, so he will speed his way all the way to his third base, but actually a bunker with four marines will take that out. And Hero with another good recall here, going to retreat from what was not a favorable position back to his natural expansion. I love the play to take 12 o'clock here. He knows eventually, oh, Protoss is going to have to try, or Ter Terran, excuse me, he's going to have to try to expand into there. So far, so good here for uh, Hero. Uh, by the way, I got to give uh, Keen, I got to sing him a little bit of praise here. He's actually playing much better than I thought. Uh, he is going toe to toe with Hero now. Especially after a couple early hiccups, too, to, you know, have the game stabilize as well as it has for Keen is a feat in and of itself. And. One thing I am worried about, though, is his army composition, specifically this one right here, does not win that fight against that Protoss army just ahead of it. And Keen's scanning. He does know this. It's a very precarious position here, but he has to try and make something happen. He has to be active on the map. And unfortunately for him, it feels like Hero really doesn't have that many weaknesses. Now, EMP is coming in on the shield batteries. Overcharge <laughs> will be forced and will shoot this away. I don't think I've ever quite casted that move right there. No. Uh, oh, no, Tasis. I think this army might get caught here. Yeah, this is looking bad. Remember, if Phoenixes are there, then the, the um, medevacs can be hunted. He's going to be able to gun down some of them, but it looks like they'll all be able to unload. So some more damage over here on Hero's side of things. Yeah, Hero not quite having the momentum there with the Phoenixes losing a bit of speed. That's going to result in some probe loss here. But I think Hero, with the bank that he has, he doesn't mind losing these 10 probes that much at all. He just cleaned up a yeah. fat chunk of Keen's army. He's going to remax on even more power. Even more Zealots, even more Colossi. And it's going to be difficult for Keen to stop the counter push, which I feel like at this point, especially given the banks, is almost inevitable. Terran do have this problem I call the quadrant problem, where they really can't get out of their quadrant of the map to expand. They're not erased. I mean, you see it sometimes. I mean, I've, I've, I've cast tomorrow's games, guys, I know. But most <laughs> of the time, you know, they have a hard time getting out of that little square corner of the map. And so Protoss can do it a little bit more uh, liberally. You know, I think Zerg obviously have it the easiest by making creep highways. And, you know, Protoss, is, um, their hook is that they have recall and warp in, so they can right. manage it a little bit better. Uh, Medivacs are obviously very fast, but incomparable to, like, a creep highway uh, or warp in. And so the fact that Hero's just kind of growing into these spots that Terran can't really prevent, 
is getting scary. And this center expansion, I don't know how wise this is for the Terran. I feel like it's so pokeable for the Protoss. I think right now Keen feels like he's up against the ropes and he just wants to fortify the center position because that's where he wants to kind of park his army and just try to weather the storm here. As he should know, given the situation, that Hero is Ooh. in a pretty commanding position. Now we have the DT hit squad coming out. DT Blink, I think, is now done. So, yep, Blink is confirmed right there. He's going to start trying to snipe down some planetaries. Keen with a nice counterattack here at the 2 o'clock, able to take down that base. Actually, going for this middle nexus, too. So, starting to slow Hero down just a bit. These are the moves that he needs to make if he wants to start a comeback. Okay, he's going to come in here with that Blink right on top of the planetary. Oh, There's just man. nothing you can do repair-wise to stop this. Uh, and by the way, this is a crazy first game to have things start off. Um, we do have the push coming out now. Archon starting to damage some of these Vikings. Uh, two Warp Prisms. Double Warp Prism. Wow, coming out. Um, the DTs are eventually going to be cleaned up, but of course he can fill this in immediately. There's so many minerals available he could warp in and max out with Zealots right now. A counterattack comes down here from Keen, taking that out, a scan to kill the DTs as well. Yeah, Keen once again attacking the natural expansion here for Hero, and you know, Hero, he's going to attack right back there at Keen, takes out the middle base. He's going to be reinforcing back at home, even going for a recall there, so he does not want to go into a base trade situation. I think that, you know, Hero in his position, he still feels like he has complete control over this game, so just play the slow, methodical way, clean up this counter-attacking army, and then go for the push. Um, the attack comes down here now, and again, there's nowhere that really Keen right now can actually stay and fight. It's just a matter of Hero trying to find him and then push him away. Now, Hero's taken a lot of damage, but the reality is that Hero just has a lot more of the map. Um, the four bases that we've seen Keen be on, he's been on for a long time. Uh, he's actually opted to not make some more probes here and instead fill this up with a larger supply of just, just general Protoss army units. We see Keen trying to come in here and sandwich, but I think just no matter how you cut it, this is so much damage. The disruptor shots are just absolutely huge there from Hero as this Protoss force is nigh unstoppable. And Keen, he put up a great fight, but Hero taking a command in game number one. And I, I love that play there from Hero. He was, you know, solid from start to finish. There were some moments where it felt like, you know, Keen was just trying to start any possible fire on the map that he could yeah. to keep Hero from coming across and just straight up killing him. And it worked for a long time, and it felt like Keen actually had some fight in him. You know, there were avenues that he was trying to create to start a comeback, but Hero just too solid in pretty much every single situation there, able to, you know, put those fires out reconsolidate his forces and eventually going through with one big push to end it. I, I got to say, um, it, Keen looked very good. That was a much better, closer game than I thought we were going to have from him. Hero, uh, he was very wise in that he did not ever overextend. He would basically just kind of pull back and be like, all right, then come into me again. Come attack me. Come hit me. And then he'll shave that army off. I love the mass DTs coming out to just shut down the command centers. That's really when you could see that we're in a very late game PVT where the Protoss has the funds to basically overspend just to commit to shut down one of the few Terran bases that the Terran has left. Yeah, PVT overall has been kind of a difficult matchup for Protoss players, but it's not because of the Supreme late game generally. It's usually Terran coming in with attacks that do big damage, whether it be yeah. in the early game or in the mid game. It's those kind of harassment I think it's plays. one of the toughest mid games in StarCraft 2 is the Protoss is trying yeah. to, to kind of just not take that right amount of damage that things spiral out of control. You know, I, we didn't have Widow Mind Drops there early on, but that's one of the, the big features of the early game of the matchup is, like, if your screen is in the wrong place and you don't respond in time, you can lose, like, six workers, and right. you know, that can basically be fatal in a professional StarCraft II game. Yeah, in that game, we just saw a hero fill out his full tech tree. You know, he had Templars, he had Archons, Colossi, Disruptors, Immortals, he had Blink DTs. There's really not much more you want in a PVT yeah. in that position. And on top of that, he had so much map control that, I mean, he was just given too much space. He was able to build this massive bank. And then even when Keen would come through with these big plays and, you know, kill a good number of probes, Hero had such a comfortable lead up until that point. He's like, okay, I will just remax on more army, and then it's going to be even harder for you to get more damage done. And eventually my army will just straight up win as we saw a very lopsided final engagement there. I mean, that Protoss army, it is tough to beat someone that has an army that complex and that high tech. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was a fun game overall. Again, I'm very pleasantly surprised uh, at how well Keen uh, is playing here. Yeah. Hero does come out on top. 
Um, nothing really fancy at the start from either of those two players here. They played a very good straight-up late-game PVT. By the way, we don't get a lot of long PVTs. It's not like TVZ. No, and I kind of like late game PBT quite a bit. I like the dynamics of warp prisms and, you know, doom drops with medevacs and recalls and those positional plays that happened that we got a little bit of a taste of there in game number one. And it's, it's a shame we don't get more late game situations like that one. I think it's really fun. You know, something that was kind of funny, and I, I almost i am not sure if I was seeing it right, but there was something about the webcam with Keen where, like, occasionally, like, a, a trumpet would come up over the webcam or, or like, Wait, really? a, little, a little drawing or, like, a hand. <laughs> I don't think that's our production, so I don't know if there's some setting on his webcam that <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna have a pro gamer that's suddenly gonna have like a dog nose and dog ears, but <laughs> face filters coming out or yeah, something like that. I, 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 oh, I'm gonna it, have to it, it happened once at the start. I went, what? Like, yeah, thought, okay. it was like a little trumpet came up, and then there was another time, right around when they GG'd, like a little a little hand emoji, like like uh, <laughs> it was like a waving that. emoji or like a. It was like over his face. <laughs> it's like, I like hiding his face or something. <laughs> I did not. I swear see I'm not making this up. I, I saw something going on. And I'm like, okay, that can't be us. No, I believe you. Um, I gotta say, like sometimes when I'm watching StarCraft, I mean, whether it be casting here or watching games at home, I get such tunnel vision that I don't notice anything. Like if you asked me after that, it's like, did we have player cams during that game? I probably wouldn't know. Oh, that's <laughs> definitely a thing that happens if you're really focused and trying to talk the whole time. Yeah. You'll miss stuff that's, yeah. I mean, I mean especially me as a former Protoss player. I mean, like, I guess I still play Protoss, but as a former pro player for Protoss, yeah. I just nerd out so hard, especially getting to watch Hero play. It's, so you don't want to miss anything that he does. Yeah, know? I mean, we have this, uh, especially when we started uh, for GSL, but even like right now uh, with Artos and me both casting ASL, we have to like remember to not just go hardcore into, like, our perspective of the race right, and, like, right. completely miss the big picture. Um, so that can definitely happen. I guess there's been a slight delay. We haven't hopped into Royal Blood yet here for map number two. I don't know if that's because they're trying to get that that cam thing fixed or what. <laughs> they don't I, want any more trumpets. I think they should leave it on, to be honest. I think that's just <laughs> a better show with it. I want to see it. I feel like I'm missing out now that I didn't notice it in game number one. Oh, it's his... <laughs> okay, so okay. all right, we've got it. We've got it confirmed. We've got it confirmed. So, <laughs> it's a Discord setting where if he presses a certain key, <laughs> he's getting emotes that he's show up. Emotes that show up over his face. <laughs> let's let's just do it, man. Well, no, leave it on. Yeah, this is on. better. I like this yeah, more. I don't mind it, man. Especially. <laughs> so he's trying to turn it off. So that's what we're waiting for. I, I personally it. am against this. I think they should have him leave it on. This is hilarious. I mean, the APM these guys. I'm play glad on. I'm not insane because I'm like, <laughs> like you're talking. I go like. Did I see a trumpet? Did I see a red trumpet over his face? And I go, keep it together, uh, Tasteless. You can do this. That is really funny, uh, though, that it actually picks it up because, yeah. you know, StarCraft 2 has the ability in the game engine to kind of mute some keys. Like, there's options in the game settings to disable the Windows key so you don't, like, accidentally yeah. do it. Well, thank when you God go to, like, for that. Yeah, like, I used to do that all the time. Back in the day, if you went to an old StarCraft tournament, you had to get, like, a ruler and break the Windows key off of the keyboard. Yeah, people still do this. I think yeah. your, your keyboard actually is missing a couple of keys yeah. from... I, my, my, I've never owned a keyboard that doesn't have the Windows key missing because I'm too used to just feeling the gap right. in the keys. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why those keyboards with, like, macro keys, I can never get into it. Like, I understand, like, having a button that you can rebind to doing something else. I mean, obviously not a macro because that's not allowed in tournament play. You know, one right. key press has to be one action in the game. Right, but right. You know, like, having control groups there, I like that in theory, but... I always think that, like, the leftmost macro key is, like, the control key. And then I'm, like, not binding control groups, and I'm just getting, like, wrecked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, trials and tribulations of being a StarCraft player. Well, I Too mean, many key presses. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to do, man. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully he gets that sorted out. But uh, as soon as he does, we're going to go into this game. So right now, Hero 1-0 to zero, um, versus Keen. It was actually a great game one if you just now uh, are joining us. Um and now we need need Keen to get his uh, his play improved and his Discord settings fixed so we can get those emojis off of there. I don't know, man. He was playing pretty well. Maybe I think, the, maybe I think the, the emojis, emojis were helping him. Maybe they're giving him power. Yeah. <laughs> Keep those things on, man. Maybe that we're going to have close. this whole meta of just everybody has Discord emojis <laughs> on. That's funny, too. We can't explain why, but I, it makes them play better. I wonder what keys it is that's activating the emojis because I've never seen this before, but... God, it must be funny, though. It like, must be like a key that he's hitting for an upgrade. Because it wasn't happening all the time. Yeah, can you imagine? It wasn't it was like, like it was, you know, <laughs> the the key for Marauder or something right. where it's like we just see. Can you imagine if it's like Protoss and it's like F2 and A? Is <laughs> it's just like nothing but trumpets showing up <laughs> on the screen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it must be like a key that is pressed. Because I only saw two emojis, but I, I imagine there were probably a lot 
that were coming out because I, I saw it and didn't even remark on it because I thought I must be like losing my mind. Uh, I thought this was the <laughs> so cast where I, I, I lose my toast? marbles. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why does it yeah. smell like burnt eggs? Ah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, hopefully we will get that sorted. And um, I think it's not sorted yet. Yeah. Well, feels like the good this old wouldn't days. Wouldn't be a GSL without a long delay. Yeah. We just sit here and talk. I feel like we uh, got pretty lucky in some of the later seasons of last year. We didn't really have too many tech delays. Well, I think one thing the show's always done well is if there is a problem, it's not a thing the next time. But this is the first time we're doing GSL where the players are from home. Yeah, so they have to do the webcam. So they, yeah, they so. have to do, and I guess they do this through Discord. So yeah. Um, so we'll see. I can see that they're trying to figure it out here, talking uh, in the lobby. <laughs> yeah. But it's good to be back here with you guys um, doing GSL again. I mean, I'm glad we have another year of this. I, I can't believe it's gone on as long as it has. Uh, yeah, man. I remember being, you know, a young kid. God, wait, 20, 2010 was when we started GSL. 2010, yeah. That's I right. was in yeah. high school, I think, watching you and Dan cast GSL. Were you a senior or were you a junior? I was a senior in high school. Senior in high school. This casting is so crazy. GSL. Yeah. I remember I went, I went to college after that, and I was doing really bad in all of my classes because yeah. I was such a nerd. I would, like, have my notebook out, and I would look like I'm taking notes. I would just be theory crafting StarCraft notes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm like, so all right, funny. I'll build my pylon on 9 and 13 gateway. And it's like, okay, what if I tried going for, like, a Twilight Council and then four more gates? Like, yeah, how would that play out? That's what's so great about StarCraft is you can obsess over it and really oh, think. Man. You can really think about it a lot and then come and lab out stuff over there. I had the same thing when I was in high school. I was, like, it was some of the drawing best. the maps and, and, and trying yeah. to memorize build orders. And I didn't realize it at the time, but, like, that was really one of the highlights of my life was, yeah. you know, StarCraft 2 coming out and and what a big deal it oh, was yeah. and the hype and like the storylines out here in the GSL and no one really knowing what the best strategies are or how you should play that, the game. That was the funnest part. And I the think balance changes happening all the time yeah. and the maps getting changed. And I, I remember like being in Korea and everybody's like, okay, well, who's going to be the best? Yeah. Is it going to be the Warcraft 3 guys? Is it going to be the Starcraft Brood War guys? Is it going to be just a, a whole new group of people? Like maybe nobody be able to switch over? Uh, and then just seeing all the different strats and the different units that were being used. And, you know, when you look at any RTS game, you can be completely off on what's good and what's bad with units, you know? Right. Uh, all right. I think we've got it fixed. Okay. No more Thank emojis God. here coming out of Keen. Yeah. Maybe Thank he goodness. Just, maybe he just gets 2 would and there's going to be a sad emoji that has nothing to do with Discord. <laughs> he opens uh, he opens Discord up and re-enables them just yeah, to yeah. a sad face. <laughs> Um, uh, so we're going to go to Royal Blood. We apologize for the delay, but it looks like we got it fixed. Hero vs. Keen continues on for Group B Match 1 in the GSL. Code S. Let's go. DKZ Gaming. Hero. I almost feel like the robot voices have gotten like toned down a little bit today. Am I crazy about that? It's like that? the robot's more tired today. <laughs> he didn't freaks. sleep. It was too busy. Slow on rewatching that last game we had for <laughs> Group A. I'm curious to see what kind of builds Hero has prepared here. We got to keep in mind too that like Hero probably thinks he can win this GSL. And by the way, by the way, this is no disrespect to Keen, but. Sometimes if you're one of the players, like Maru or Hero, or you're trying to actually navigate fully a 16-person tournament, because that's kind of what you do, which is why you're so rich with prize pool money and yeah. so <clears throat> famous for the great games, is that uh, a player like Keen, you might not really bring anything special out with, because I think he just feels like he's probably a little bit better. Like, his, if it was an RPG character, his stats would all be a little bit higher. Yeah. And maybe he just wants to play a straight up game because why would you show the, the best PBT strats when you know there are actually so many good Terrans in this specific GSL code S? It's one of the reasons why we often see a lot of uh, all-ins come out. Really cheesy plays from very top players early in the rounds of tournaments because not only is it a skill check on your opponent, I mean, I, I know that for having played in Pro League and gotten proxy gated out of the one game that I got to yeah. play there. But um, it also has the added benefit of exactly what you said. I mean, for these top tier championship caliber players, it really is a marathon. It's not a sprint hero is thinking beyond just Group B, although of course he's going to try his best to advance and think about you know, what, what kind of builds and what kind of strategies he should keep in his back pocket should he meet Maru in the next round, for example. Yeah, exactly. You know, just try to bank up what you can 
so that when you really have to do the crazy stuff, it's going to be the first time your opponent's seeing it. We've seen a lot of big shifts as well here in the in the metagame overall. We had a good amount of TVZs yesterday. It was interesting to see the double racks wallen at the expansion entrance uh, yeah. with, with Reapers coming out, um, actually doing damage for the first time ever, it feels like. Um, and you remember the season before that state, we were talking about, you know, Terrence going for command center first into two base all in. So things have changed a lot. It seems like PBT is no exception as well. Yeah, Hero going for an early Zealot here. Going to try and apply a bit of pressure. Keen just going to throw down a bunker back at home. So won't be any hiccups in his build from that one Zealot as Hero just mixing it up a little tiny bit here with his openings. I wonder if there's any kind of... You know, special sauce you can cook here with one Adept and a Zealot to try and get some damage in. But with that bunker, I feel like... I think you just can't. Yeah, you just can't. Look at how big this ship is in the wheat. <laughs> Next to this <laughs> command center. you got to be able to make that in the game. Um, That's where the players flew in on, man. <laughs> here is right. one of those two. <laughs> That's where his command center flew out of. <laughs> um, so we have three command centers being made right now for Keen. Um, this is not a bad way uh, to open. We have seen it get abused by... Uh, stalkers with Blink. In this case, we Ooh. don't have Stalkers with Blink. We have, um, oh, by the way, an Adept actually gets in here in Scouts. That's so funny. Actually, this SCV, <laughs> these SCVs with the wall being lifted like that. Oh, Hero actually picks off another SCV there. I wasn't aware he had so much damage done on the building one. So Hero not only with a full Scout here because Keen had that wall in incomplete or not down, but also getting an SCV pick. And, I mean, you take that any day of the week here as Hero. Hero going for a DT build himself, War Prism underway too, so you know, benefit here for Keen is that he's going for the Cyclone and on top of that he also will have three orbital commands, so there should be no lack of scans to stop this Dark Shrine. Now, I mean any kind of early attack can be pretty devastating to a player that went for three command centers. I'm curious how DTs are going to do against this. There is um, a Cyclone out, which is sort of the de facto deflect all of, of harass. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously having three orbitals means you're going to have scans, but, you know, sometimes you can kind of run and hide with the DTs. So this is going to be an interesting moment here. He's making another gate, and he's making an immortal. So remember that he saw three command centers. DT Blink, by the way. Yeah, DT Blink also being researched here. I was thinking that we might see Hero goes straight for a third base off of this blink drop, but it looks like instead he's just gonna power up a little bit more on two bases, and okay, clutch scan coming in here by Keen, well, will confirm. Does he have a scan for this DT? These DTs, actually. He's got two over here, and it's like he scans and sees the tech and then can't see the DTs that are actually attacking him. Yeah, the, the command center in the main base looks like it's almost at 50 energy. That scan now does come through, and he will be able to pick off this DT here at the natural expansion, but the one in the main base still getting a lot of damage, and Hero, he's got to be really happy with this right now. There is a turret coming down in the natural base, so that will secure that position from any future harassment. But oh, he gets oh that cyclone. God. For a second, I didn't see that SCV. I thought yeah, he was going to yeah. kill it. Well, yeah, I think he's going to get it anyways. Yeah, he takes he that out. And remember, DT Blink's going to finish, so when he gets a scan, you can just blink out of range. Man, this is just going so well here for Hero. It's not anticipate so much damage coming in. Unfortunately, that DT does go down before Blink is able to finish. We'll see if there is a follow-up drop. There are two more DTs here in this Warp Prism, so there is potential for that play. And Hero wants to make it happen. He's Chrono boosting that Dark Shrine. Now, if he gets a couple more DTs with Blink, you have to wonder, is there going to be an opportunity to just Blink on top of stuff? This was one of the funny things that came with Blink itself. Um, hold on. It looks like he might start trying to play for that. You know, trading some DT HP yeah. to try and kill some Marines there. He might want to go for one of those plays where he just kind of blinks on top of everything and tries to clean out a small section yeah, of it, King's it, army. It's a funny thing with DTs because we don't really think of them as fighting units. Like, usually when they're good is when they're not being seen, and then when they're spotted, they die out. But if you have a bunch, yeah, well, I guess he's just going to go for Archons, actually. Yeah. Now, this is another very good opportunity here, especially with some of these SCVs already damaged. Yeah, and I mean, you can always do damage with these Archons and just lose the shields and, you know, kind of be fine. Especially when the SCVs oh, group my together. My, God. Dude, this is 15 kills. This is insane. Yeah, that feels... Look at that. It's a, it's a graveyard of uh, SCVs. God, that feels like almost game-ending damage. I mean, obviously, yeah. we're going to keep playing it out. Keen, he, he does not want to go down 2-0 here in the first Whoa. match, and... There are potential avenues for him to try and navigate a victory here, but the early DC harassment already felt so good there for Hero, more yeah. than he bargained for. 
And then to have the SCVs bunch up like that and have 16 more fall. <laughs> two immortals here, too. Oh, my God. It's like, what's in the drop this time? Yeah, this is brutal. This is like Noah's Ark of, of Protoss drops. Just two, <laughs> two of each kind time. of units <laughs> coming in there to end the game. <laughs> it's just, I love that analogy, yeah. man. It really is. Wow. All right. And then he loaded everything up on the Ark. Um, uh, all right. So, well, let's see if Keen is going to be able to survive the flood here because, I mean, Hero, it looks like he's getting ready for this. It looks like I missed this on the production tab, but it does seem like these Zealots do have charge. And yeah, charging in right now. Yeah. Those Immortals going to quickly dispatch the Bunker oh, and the Siege Tank. GG, that's it. Yeah, Force Field comes in on the natural ramp, and that is Queen, er, Queen, excuse me, Keen, getting obliterated right there by Hero with some phenomenal early DT and Archon play. I mean, that just did so much damage, more than you would ever hope to accomplish in pretty much any opening, just... The Keen was unprepared. The DT started it, um, and it's funny. Like we saw the scan, and, and we were like, "Oh, nice!" He he sees it, and then we go back, and there's like two DTs, one in each of the line line. He's just like, "Uh oh, okay." Yeah. And he didn't bank up any scans. Um, so they the DT started it. Archons came in there. It almost did uh, so much damage. I wasn't even ready for it. It was like 15 or 16 SCVs killed, uh, and then the push. You know, with the Immortals, I mean, he made it look very easy. Keen may be playing a little bit too greedy uh, in that game, too. We're going to go to a break. We come back. The next match in Group B, you don't want to miss it. We'll be right back.
드디어 카운트다운을 시작합니다. 4, 3, 2, 1 제로 칼로리로 기분까지 가볍게 밀키스 제로 And we are back here at the GSL. This is Group B. We just saw Hero crush through Keen uh, in a pretty convincing series. Keen not looking bad, though. I think he showed some promise. Yeah, it got caught a little bit unprepared there in game number two for the DT drop and suffered a quick defeat there as a result. But in game number one, he looked quite solid. And uh, now, Tasteless, TVZ is on the menu again. And Let's you guys watching at home, you better savor this one because we only have two Zergs right now in the GSL Code S. Yeah. They're still standing. I'm kind of relishing this GSL after <laughs> that many Zergs have just been killing it over the years. Um, but you know what? Something tells me we're somehow going to have like Dark in the finals that it's like yeah. the wins are like, huh. It could be solar and dark. I mean, they did it in the it's super like tournament. It's like GSL ends as it starts. It's like, remember, Fruit Dealer was like the only guy, the only Zerg right. in like the top eight, and then it's going to be dark Ooh. doing the same thing. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a point. And then he takes his mask off. He was Fruit Dealer the Fruit whole time. Dealer we go, all oh! along. Yeah. Um, I forgot about that. What a story that was, Fruit Dealer fighting for the first man. GSL. Um, so this match, uh, out of all the games that we're going to start, you know, the first two best of threes we're going to have for – Group A through D. This is the one I really was the least sure about who's going to take this. Yeah, I, Curious kind of, I mean, he's one of the best Terran players in the world without a doubt. For but sure. At least for me, when I'm watching Cure play, the thing that I'm most impressed from him is generally his TBP. His TBZ, yeah. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I feel like I don't have as many data points on where exactly he stands in TBZ. He, he's good. He's definitely just overshadowed by Mario and some other yeah. Terrans. Um, I think he's got a shot. I think Solar is in, in very good shape. Um, you could see here had a disappointing showing at IEM, at least compared to Solar. Solar... Mm -hmm. um, you know, he won Super Tournament top eight in IEM is very good. Yeah, two top 16s um, in GSL Code S as well last season. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's a threat. Um, I really like his room setup, by the way. Oh, that's a this fantastic, fantastic room. This is the new best room. This is the best. He's If there's brackets for the rooms, <laughs> he's going on. I want to have a house party at Solar's house, man. That's nice. It looks like a good place to hang out. Yeah. I didn't actually look at Kira's room, so we got to look at that when we go. Uh, <laughs> it is strange. I always judge their their home setup. <laughs> it like, has nothing to do with this. But um, well, I wonder if there's going to be any player that just has the big green screen up behind him. I'm not a fan of that when I see that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons of it, right? Like, if you have the green screen set up, it does look kind of sleek and professional. Yeah. But also, it's less for us to talk about. So. Yeah, that's true. I said I don't like it. Then I remember my brother does that show with, with mostly walking with his green screens up behind him. Just called him out by accident <laughs> for doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th this one's going to be tough to call. Uh, I think this should be probably one of our best matches here for the round of 16. I think oh, that, certainly. I think that either player can, can can take it. I personally can't predict one. And now I know I don't remember Kira's room because oh, it's just uh, a door. Yeah, he's in the uh, storage closet right now <laughs> in a hotel. Yeah. Um, before they put anything in there. Um, it's empty. It's empty, man. Um, well, this should be a fantastic match here, Kira versus Solar here. So we get ready to go into set number one on Gresbin, second match of Group B. Club NV. 
cure. Onside gaming, solar. Solar kind of has like spikes on his back. I the picture that. like that. <laughs> I'm his, zoned his picture in. with the Zerg logo back. Look at the trophies back there. He's got That's checks. A nice room. Stuffed animals and everything. I too. know. He's got everything you need. Well, uh, here we go again, Tasteless. It's a triple racks. I feel like we're seeing a little bit more of this here this season than we did previously. Am I, am I, I going think crazy? You're right. It's been a lot of I think, I think these builds are, are, are more useful to rotate into Star League style tournaments like this one. Right. I feel like at IEM, you know, there's so many games going on. Nobody's really able to sit down and thumb through the information of, you know, who's doing what. Oh, man, um, this Overlord. It's now, barely going to miss this. This is a, a trend I've actually really enjoyed seeing, and it's like such a tweak on the already cheesy build is you make two next to each other, mm -hmm. and the third a little bit far away because you respond to two differently than you, res you respond to three. Right. So even if you spot it, if you pull away because you don't want to drop the Overlord, you still might not get the read. But the fact that he doesn't see this at all, I almost think we can call this as probably a cure win unless um, we see Solar already uh, you know, blindly trying to counter this. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to know what's coming his way until it hits him, more or less, and that's usually not how you want things to go or shake out here against th two racks, let alone three racks proxy as it is here for Cure. Now, Solar, he is going for Zergling Speed, does have that Gas Geyser in production, but... Uh, I mean, ah, this is... This, this is... is <laughs> no, I mean, he doesn't even have Zergling Speed coming. He's spawning pools, like, still building. So, I mean, he's going to pull the drones. Yeah. Um, this will prompt the uh, SCVs to, to retreat, but only for a little bit. And again, it's a three um, SCV rush here. So there's a lot of time to basically make structures. The creep does block him, actually. Yeah, creep spread a little bit faster here in this patch than in previous patches when that hatchery does get planted. And you can see Solar desperately trying to get a surround. He actually was able to surround some of those SCVs, but you really want to go for the DPS here. Is now getting joined with the Zerglings, but all oh, the first two falling there. And Solar, he's trying his best to buy time. For this spine crawler to get up, but oh, it's it gonna go down. doesn't feel yeah. like he's going to be able to. And, you know, honestly, all three SCVs are still alive. Uh, not that he's going to be making a bunker, but it's just like that much more damage that you can soak up. He stutter steps forward here. The Lings are coming back out. They're going to have to retreat. The Queen is at half health. Yeah, that Queen precariously low in hit points right now as Kyrgyz stutter steps micro his way towards the victory here as Solar, he desperately needs to get us around. Able to get some kills there on Marines, but this is just snowballing massively in Cure's favor. Yeah, the Queen, again, it stayed alive, but now he can target down the drones. The drones get pulled here, the links come up. It seems like the control here from Cure might just be a little bit too good. Yeah, GG. that's going to be it. Cure's taking a very clean game number one there as Solar just unlucky with the scouting pattern, not sending a drone scout, maybe a little bit greedy, and Cure just Right out of the field of vision, knew exactly where to place those three barracks, and it's an easy 1-0. It's an easy 1-0. He, he did win that, but it looks like he's missing the, the remote for his, uh, his air, air conditioner, conditioner that's on the wall mount there. <laughs> but other than that, he's he killed it. Look, I mean, you didn't scout the rush. He sent the Overlord up uh, towards the top. That is the more common place for people to put the three Raxes. But you can also put it down at the bottom, which is exactly what he did. And I wonder um, how much of that is... Um, Cure preparing specifically here for Solar because a lot of these players since IAM Katowice, they've been playing and grinding a ton of online, you know, qualifiers or online leagues, getting ready to, you know, stay in form here for GSL Code S and earn a little bit more money. So that could be Cure just identifying that, you know, Solar on this map is a little bit greedy. Yeah. With his overlord scouting pattern. And then also as you pointed out, you know, the way that he built those first two barracks close together and then one slightly further away. He's like, okay, well if he does spot it. He might just think it's a two racks, not the three racks, yeah. because he's not going to overextend with the he, Overlord. He has to do a very deep scout yeah. to come in there and figure out what's going on. Um, I mean, it was it was a good opening here for Cure. It, it's going to be a much easier best of three coming forward. I don't think he'll cheese again necessarily, but you know what will he do? Uh, all he has to do is make something work one more time, and he's off to the winner's match against Hero. I'm kind of curious if we're going to see him do something similar to what Bjorn did in his TVZs. Mm, yeah, the Tuesday, double racks. Because Bian was saying in his interview that he kind of thinks this might be something we see a little bit more common here yeah. in this new year, this kind of two barracks on the low ground, three Reaper opening, because you know, oftentimes we see the first Reaper come out and like you maybe kill a Ling and maybe you make it kind of hard for Zerg to plant a creep tumor, but eventually it does get down, and that's about it. 
in terms of utility, right? But this Three Reaper opening, it has potential. We've seen a lot of drones fall. We've seen Lings fall. We've seen Creep Tumors get sniped. It's funny. I think I think the cheese build does pair well with a meta, uh, a meta game where you have people doing the two forward raxes. Yeah, that could be it too. I, I think that it's it's pretty. There's a lot to it that's really smart because I think you need a different type of reaction to the Reapers coming forward, which makes you want to be really greedy with the drones and try to get ready for everything else to to be there for that. And then this much cheesier and frankly stronger rush comes in and blindsides you. And it's cool to see, you know, Terran's kind of shake up the matchup a little bit here with these openings. Because yeah. oftentimes, you know, when Zergs are dominating, it's in periods where we don't have patches, right? And this isn't necessarily mm -hmm. the result of a patch, that people are going for Reaper openings like this or going for three racks, which has been around for Legacy of the Void for ages, right? But, you know, you can kind of get the same effect as Terran's as a whole, as a community, by just kind of shaking up the meta and... You know, having more potential to throw things Zerg's way. So maybe that's one of the reasons why we only had three Zergs here in GSL Code S. Maybe it's one of the reasons why we had our first Zerg eliminated in Group A. And now here in Group B, Solar already down 1-0 to Cure. Royal Blood will be map two. Uh, this is Solar's pick. We're loading that map up right now. Cure wins with a three racks rush. What will happen in game two? Remember that the winner goes on to face off against Hero uh, in the winner's match here for Group B in the GSL Code S. Club Envy, Cure. Onside Gaming, Solar. Such a good room. It's a really good it's room. Very well organized. Look at the big prize check. Yeah. All the way up there in the top. I like it. It's either you put that there or above the fireplace, you know? It's flexing all the gamers watching GSL yeah, right now. Look yeah. at my trophies. Look at my, <laughs> yeah, my shrine of greatness. I feel like we we almost take for granted how storied StarCraft II is with a decade-long history, all of these oh, tournaments, all these champions, and it's kind of surreal to see something like that in Solar's room. You know, just how many championships and, like, runner-ups and all these other trophies that you actually <laughs> Oh, accumulate it's, it's, on your shelves being one crazy. of the best Zerg players in the world for ages. RTS and I guess maybe like, you know, the original Counter-Strike up to now. I mean, there's been so much story with him. He's got more gold than all this you see right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, nothing. That's nothing compared that's to what nothing. Solar has yeah, in compared his Compared to his bookshelf behind him <laughs> at the computer. Yeah, it, it, it is true though. Like, you know, we've had these players be around for so long. They've been so strong. They've inspired us for so many years. Um, and that's why they're so hungry. They're like, well, you know, how much GSL's left? I got to get in as many more wins as I can and leave on a high note. Yeah, everyone's motivated to give it their best shot here in 2023. And we see um, a little bit more of a standard opening here coming out of Cure. No low ground. Low ground um, two racks opening as we saw Bion favor yesterday. Right. Instead just going for the high ground one barracks with a Reaper, low ground CC. This is, this is a, a little bit of an older build. Older is never bad, by the way. It's just something we've seen before. Right. Uh, and he may have his own spin on it as we get further on into this. Yeah, I'm kind of liking this play right here from Solar 2, coming out with these four lings, going to try and avoid this Reaper moving across map. Maybe he'll be able to pick off that SCV, building the command center. There is one Marine on the field already here if for there, Cure, but... If there is a, a big kill early on, it's this SCV, because it just slows down everything else with the build, and the one Marine can't actually fight this. So a couple more SCVs are pulled. Uh, a lot of SCVs actually getting pulled here. And... Honestly, probably the best control you could ask for here from Cure. Yeah, He's Solar. not actually losing anything, so. And Solar knows when he does an opening like this that these four links, they're dead. They're not going to get out of that mm -hmm. alive with a Reaper on the map or with those units in Cure's base. So you know, when he's controlling those Zerglings, he's just trying to buy as much idle time there from Cure as possible and delay that command center as long as possible. And well, that was pretty effective for him. It cost him 100 minerals, cost him two larva, but I mean, you can take that as a win. Alleviate some pressure too. Was able to get this third hatchery down because that Reaper did go home. I'm liking this opening so far here for Solar. And okay, third CC for Cure. Yeah, I mean, I like what Cure is doing as well. I mean, you know, a very different approach. I, I, I love talking about how, you know, these builds are kind of connected to each other, right? There's, you know, a, 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 
really beautiful thing to try to switch from build to build to build to be unpredictable that you know even the small micro adjustments and remember starcraft 2 is the fastest rts which means you have to make decisions particularly in builds much quicker than starcraft 1 then warcraft 3 uh and so using previous builds and then playing a very different route you can actually uh, punish somebody you know that doesn't have time to think and, and, and guess you know what's next yeah, we're even getting proper scouting information too because yeah. you know builds develop so quickly in this game that limited information plays a bigger role in StarCraft 2 than a lot of RTS titles that have existed over the span of this genre. And oh my goodness, Cure, two factories. Oh my oh god, you're right. Oh boy. <laughs> we already have Hellions in production, so there's a, that's the third factory coming in. We have three CC mech. Now hold on. Now, 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 this is, I, I don't want to say gimmicky, but it is definitely a build that, like, we see brought out. We've even seen Maro do this once before. But it's like, no. Yeah, this You're going to go for fun. this build. It's a super fun build to cast. It's super different. If you lose control of the mid game, by the way, uh, the Zerg just takes the whole map and you die. Yeah, it's... it's you're playing on a knife's edge pretty much the entire time yeah. as a mech player, especially here in TBZ. I, I think you have to have, and, and by the way, this is not the mech you're thinking of where he's like just gonna make tanks and sit there. That's battle mech. It's, it's uh, I think it was Gumiho that did this first. I might be wrong. I think um, no, that sounds right. That it sounds, sounds like right. something Gumiho would yeah. do. Even if he didn't do it first, he spiritually did yeah, it first. Yeah, man. He, <laughs> he, he dreamt of it and he gave someone <laughs> else Inception and then they did it in GSL. Exactly. Um, but the, um, the idea here is that you come out with just a different composition. It's one that has a lot more uh, ability to kite or to like kind of micro away, not like stutter step, but you just pull away, fire, pull away, fire. Absolutely. Um, and, and if the Zerg isn't ready for it, they're just suddenly dealing with a composition that's very different. Now seeing the floating barracks kind of gives it away. Yeah, Solar, if he was paying attention there, which he should have with that scout coming into the third base, is he's been trying for a while now to figure out exactly what Kira's plan is. Should know what's going on, seeing that floating barracks, and certainly does now here with two Cyclones on the field. Upgrades about to finish both of these Hellions and Cyclones. This Solar with a lot of Queens. Gonna be doing his best to push this away, but those Cyclones, they do so much damage, man. I mean, the energy here on the Queens, it is limited. Yeah, and, and you can see that, you know, you can kind of move out on the map and not really care. By the way, the floating barracks is there to spot for the Cyclones. Right, their range is longer. And actually, hold that thought, Tasteless, is we have a run by here. Solar trying to pick up some Cyclones and alleviate some of the pressure there back at home. Ooh, very but, good control there. Yeah, both flame are just so good. Yeah. Um, now, you know, we're starting to see the Queens drop. Looks like another one's taken out. I only see four that were up there. Has six queens in total, so I think four there in the front, and then two probably injecting as three have fallen so far. And Kira's doing a good job of whittling away at this army, but at the same time, he is losing a lot of Hellions, and Hellions are really kind of the anchoring unit here that stops Zerg from coming in with Lings to get that big surround and the Bayley connection. Oh my god, the Bayley are so close. He just sacks one Hellion, yeah. throws that in there, says, well, how about you trade it efficiently? Okay, we may be at the tipping point right now. Yeah, um, I feel like I, this is snowballing hard. Well, that, not just that, but I think organically, the longer this is here, the sooner that Baneling's nest is going to die. The centrifugal and, hooks is not going to finish, I don't think. Yeah, I think actually, you just did like a master class game and taking down a Zerg with this build. A, a lot of times we see this backfire in the mid game, but I think he's basically got it. I think the nest is still there. So, it doesn't matter, GG. Wow, what an incredible TVZ series this was. We're like, the planning, the prep went in. Solar didn't even get to play any game that he wanted today. Yeah, I mean, you know that Solar has a game plan coming yeah. into this series, and Kira's just like, no, we're going to do exactly what I want us to do. Comes in with a three racks there in game number one, some nice battle mech there in game number two, and that's going to be a victory there for Kira. Really fast 2-0. I got to say, I was expecting this to be probably one of the most <laughs> competitive matches that we cast today here in Group B. Same, yeah. But yeah. Kira just kind of dunked on him with some really good game planning. I mean, that's all strategy right there. Yeah, and and, and really perfect uh, pushing there. He knew exactly when to come in. He just kept picking off the queens. Um, I love seeing the barracks come in for a second when the, when the rush started. We were like, oh, well, he sees the barracks. That's kind of a giveaway. But then the barracks lets you spot. Right. So that there's just literally no way the queens can ever get outside of vision. They, they You know, 
The Cyclone Vision's not that great, especially when you have to run away. Uh-huh. But having the, the barracks there to spot for that, and then just picking off the Banelings. I mean, here's the thing, too. I don't really know what Kira's TVZ looks like if he's not playing like this. I don't know what Solar wanted to do today. They uh, might be potentially p- playing in the decider match, depending on who plays yeah. against Hero. And, guys, we're going to go into the next match after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
드디어 카운트다운을 시작합니다. 떴다. 제로 칼로리로 기분까지 가볍게. 밀키스 제로. 그냥 개인적인 일로 바쁘게 지내다가 최근에 게이머스 에이시라는 사우디아라비아에서 열린 대회 예전에도 올라가고 그래, 그런, 그랬던 것 같습니다 최근에 일본으로 가족 여행도 다녀왔는데 굉장히 힐링되었던 시간이었던 것 같습니다 최근에 바둑을 좀 시작했거든요 좀 배우다가 요즘 또 대회가 많아져서 잠깐 쉬고 있어요 또 하고 싶은 일이 좀 생겨서 또 이제 다른 일도 좀 하면서 시간 남을 때 스타트도 열심히 했습니다 아 바로 떠오르는 건 희범이의 탈락이었던 것 같아요 좋은 성적을 내고 있는 선수여서 너무 <웃음> 충격적이었던 것 같고 신한 형으로서 안타까웠던 것 같습니다 뭐 아무래도 신영 형의 진출이죠 신영 형이 2주 동안 게임 안 하다가 예선 8시간 전에 한 10판 하고 뚫었거든요 말이 안 돼요 네, 대협이 형은 열심히까지는 아니고 그냥 어느 정도 했는데 근데 토스라서 토스는 원래 그폼 올라오는데 다른 종족에 비해서 되게 금방 올라오거든요 폼이 그래가지고 뭐 놀랍지 않아요 저는 대엽이 형이랑 신영이 형 온라인 경기를 보긴 봤는데 좀 쉬면서 하고 있는 선수들이 이기고 올라갈 줄 알았거든요 근데 그두분다 너무 잘하는 선수들이 이기고 올라가서 저렇게 빨리 올라갈 수 있구나 좀 신기했어요 근데, 근데 이 신영한테는 어떻게 돼있어 어, 서로 명경기를 펼치다가 서로 누가 덜 실수하냐 싸움에서 제가 실수를 좀더 많이 했습니다 일단 시범이가 떨어지고 신영이 형이 올라온 게 제일 놀라웠고 솔직히 대엽이 형이랑 신영이 형은 아무리 잘했어도 전역하고 바로 뚫는 게 진짜 힘든데 확실히 클라스 영원하다는 걸 이게 보여준 게 멋있었던 것 같아요. 그럼 본인을 결승에서 이겼던 전태양의 클래스는 어떤? 태양이는 좀 재능은 확실히 좀 높은데 이게 옛날만큼 절실함이 없지 않나. 빡세요. 너무 빡세요. 개인적으로 종족별로 제가 좀 까다롭게 생각한 사람 두 명이 있어가지고 김도 김준호 있어가지고 진출이 솔직히 쉬울 것 같지는 않아요. 그래도 이기려면은 투테란을 잡고 올라가야 되지 않을까 싶네요. 일단은 태종발. 테란 김도욱 선수가 제일 경계되고 민수도 최근에 제가 온라인 대회에서 많이 졌었던 이력이 있어가지고 민도석을 좀 만들어야 되지 않을까 준호 형이 그래도 제일 빡세지 않나 요즘 테란전에 좀 자신 없다고 하던데 항상 그러면서도 잘했던 형이라 안, 안 믿고 있어요 저는 오히려 강민 선수가 제일 까다로울 것 같고 솔직히 태태전은 큰 차이 안날것 같거든요 개인적으로 그래서 올라가는 시나리오는 김준호 선수만 어떻게든 잡아내면 은 변수가 일어나지 않을까라고 생각을 하고 있습니다 GSL이 아무래도 자기만 그렇게 엄청 막큰 느낌이 아니라서 저는 되게 마음 편히 임하고 지더라도 어쩔 수 없고 올라가게 된다면 최선을 다하겠습니다 언제가 마지막이 될지 모르기 때문에 항상 최선을 다할 거고 좋은 성적을 거두고 싶어요 2022년에는 제가 성적이 많이 안 좋았는데 2023년에는 우승도 하고 좋은 모습 많이 보여줄 수 있도록 하겠습니다 좋은 성적은 아니라도 많은 스타트 팬들 아니면 제 팬들한테 기억이 남을 수 있는 감명 깊은 경기를 만들 수 있도록 노력하고 준비해서 경기에 임하겠습니다. 
We had a very fast uh, TVZ where Cure, I mean, he could not have won more against Solar. I don't know where this puts him going up against Hero. All I'll say is that Cure has put a lot of prep in for today. Yeah, I was really impressed with this TVZ. Again, we, we were talking about this before he played against Solar, but I kind of think about that guy as a TVP specialist. Yeah. And TVZ is one of those things where, you know, don't have as many data points, at least for me personally watching his games. But he came in swinging today. He had a game plan, and it worked to perfection with a clean 2-0. Neither game particularly close. I mean, like, just the three racks completely caught Solar off guard. And then in game number two... The battle mech, I mean, he, he microed it perfectly. He hit it yeah. just as long as he needed to do and was easily able to convert that into a win. Yeah, and, and so now we go to Hero versus Cure. Um, I do think Hero is going to really show us what he's planned out today. I think Hero expected to beat Keen, but knew he was either going to be up against Cure or Solar, both of which are basically major threats from the round of 16 all the way up to the round of four for Hero. You know, um, so... This should be a pretty exciting match. I do look forward to how Hero is going to approach this. We've seen before versus Maru that Hero knows how to map out styles of play that even Maru can't be ready for. So uh, what will he have planned here for Keen? I'm not sure. I feel like it's going to be something kind of crazy here because Kira is one of the best TVP players in the world. And, you know, Hero, if he wins this match, he is moving on from the round of 16 to the round of 8. Right. And that's a big stepping stone on the path towards reaching the semifinals and eventually the finals. So I wouldn't expect Hero to try and save anything here for future PBTs. I think he's going to give it the best he's got. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. We're going to Babylon for map one. Remember that the winner of this best of three survives um, and goes on to the round of eight. DKZ Gaming, Hero. Club NV, Cure. I do wonder what Hero is going to bring out here today because it felt like he was playing kind of, I don't want to say basic, but kind of vanilla in his first yeah, match yeah. against Kane. I mean, the DZ drop with Blink was pretty cool, but that's not the kind of thing that I think but you break out against a player like Maru. Didn't he also do that after he saw the third command center? Didn't he get an adept in and see that? Um, I think the adept confirmed what the build was. Because I wonder if that... But if he was already going DT. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm I wrong. Think. Uh, you could be right. I mean, it's my memory is always hazy with these kind of things in terms of timeline. Well, it's just funny because, you know, we're collecting information. Sometimes things are happening a little bit before, a little bit after. Right. What we think it's <clears> going to be. Um, but especially in game one, it was just uh, basically like a, a standard textbook PVT flex. Um, and so... Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what, what Hero's going to do. I do think game two was very impressive. It did seem like Keen kind of fell victim to his own trap. A uh, little bit. I mean, it, it's funny because when you see the three orbitals, it's like, well, that's a lot of scans, right? Uh-huh. And then but, he scans and he sees the dark shrine. Like, yeah, oh, well, he yeah. knows it's coming. Yeah, it's like he made too many mules is what you did. Um, and, and so it's like Keen kind of fell into the, the trappings of, of the greedy build itself. Uh, and it's how he was punished. So this time around, I mean, I, I do think Cure is an overall more robust, solid Terran. I think he's one of the Terrans that's maybe the best in the whole world, especially around mid game and early game fighting Protosses. I think he's also great late game, but I do think this guy is very good with his drops. He's very good with like these little tactical moments of trying to do damage and get ahead. Uh, Protoss do seem to have these moments of fragility regardless of the matchup, and including even PVP where it's like, if you just can kind of trip up their unit composition and get it lopsided, they have a hard time recovering. It's a funny little dance we have going on here. Yeah, this is the so weird. The and the Reaper, but you know what this is doing, Tasteless, is this is keeping the Reaper occupied yeah. while Hero goes for a proxy game. Yeah, the Reaper is wrestling in the bush with that Zealot when, in fact... And now it's got to go home because the Adept is out. So this yeah. gate's going to go unscouted, and we might see some heavy pressure so here this coming three out gates of Hero. Total? So three. this is a, a, a three-gate shove. Uh, this might be, I don't know for sure, but I think you might just be able to run up and kill the bunker. Oh, and it's Hellions here in two for Cure. I think that's the worst case scenario here is Terran in terms of unit selection coming out of that factory. So, 
Yeah, sometimes when you get a bunker up at the entrance, there's actually not a lot of SCVs to repair it. Um, and it hits so fast. Yeah, the damage comes out fast enough. Uh, and this is something you got to keep in mind, you know, when you get games like this, where it's like, well, yeah, maybe you would have SCVs to repair it, but can you actually pull them over there in time? And I think if he can kill the bunker, I think he might just be able to run up there and, and kill him. I could be wrong, but I can't imagine a game where you have a gateway outside the base like this. This wouldn't be about a build that you want to activate it's gonna in be, the next minute or so. It's going to be a depth. I was wondering whether he might morph in some stalkers and try and go for what you said, like the bunker kill and perhaps a killing blow. But instead, it's going to be a huge adept shade coming in. Oh, my god. Oh, he's going for the natural. He had the opportunity to go into the main base, but instead just going to pounce on these SCVs. Marines and the Hellion doing a ton of damage already. It takes three shots to take these units down, but there are so many adepts that it really doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, this is already really bad. He does load that up. I think there was not actually full Marines in that bunker. I think some of the SCVs are actually in there right now. Yeah, exactly. Only one Marine in total. Yeah. And um, it, because of this, I mean, he could basically come up. Uh, I think he might actually not get this depot in time. He's going to try to switch the damage down onto these SCVs. They do repair this pretty quickly. He's not getting the depot, but I don't think he's ever expecting to get the depot. He's trying to force right. Cure to come out with the SCVs to repair so we can get even more kills. And I mean, right now, Hero are already up six workers overall, getting a ton of damage in, and also kind of slowing down Cure, building up his army. I mean, he got that Hellion. He never got to use it for anything he wanted to. All of his Marine count got reset now. He only has a handful of Marines here with his first Siege tank. So overall, I think Hero is going to be very happy with his position. That was a successful attack. And now we're going to have um, Stalkers come into play. This is a very cool way to approach this because he does the initial damage with the Adepts. He's continuing to scout in. He's confirming that there's a Siege tank up. But, you know, a, a Blink Warp Prism Stalker build could just end up taking him out in the main here. Now, I think seeing the Stalkers, you're probably going to be able to guess what's coming, but let's see exactly how Kier handles this because sometimes knowing is not actually enough. He's already lost a lot of workers and Marines early on. He doesn't have as much to protect the tanks. We see five uh, Marines up here now. Yeah, let's see what Hero decides to do with this. I feel like there might be able... He might be able to kind of ride the momentum from that early attack with some Blink Stalker follow-up, but I also wouldn't be surprised to see him just throw it on a third base and try to play the longer game here, maybe even more of a gateway man kind of style here, knowing that Cure's you know, Marine count did get soft reset there early. And Okay, so it's gonna be Blink Stalker pressure, but he's going for Templar Archives and Charge behind this. So it's not really the kind of all in we usually see. And actually blinking in, he will be able to pick off oh. the Raven. Gonna have to micro here with his Warp Prism though. Instead, a couple of Suckers going down. I don't know if that was worth it. Yeah, that was a little bit of a, a clunky moment. I think he did not realize how much was actually there ready to defend. Really, the Marines and the tank were placed basically perfectly for uh, for Kira. So uh, Hero read that information incorrectly, came in, and then lost a lot of Stalkers, at least half of them. Um, now, he can always recall this. This isn't trapped here forever. Yeah. Um, but I got to say, round two uh, of the attack there from Hero was... A lot worse than round one. Yeah, I think he just wasn't really anticipating there being so much there in the front. And he didn't have an observer, right? So he was just going with a limited vision from the warp prism. But you want to retain the element of surprise. You don't want to poke and prod, see how much they have, then come back in with the blink. Right. You want to just go for it. That time didn't pan out for Hero. It would be better to just send one to blink in first to confirm. Yeah, maybe. Let's see but if Cure is able to get some damage on with this counter push because this is now a very fragile moment here for our Protoss player. He lost a lot of Stalkers there in that push. He only has one Archon out here in Warp Prism. Zealot Charge, it should finish before the big engagement comes in. But this is a precarious position. Yeah, this, this kind of sucks for Protoss, honestly. Uh, Stim's done. I mean, Charge is done, but Stim is a little bit of a bigger deal, at least for now. We don't have any of these kind of core units, like Immortals or, um, you know, a lot of sentries to cut this up. We've got, like, one Archon. That's not exactly the number we're looking for. Um, now, Cure has a limited amount of time to try to come in here and do as much damage as he can. It looks like he wants to try to shell the infrastructure in the main. I wasn't really expecting this to be the area that he would go to. Nice blink there, dodging. The Widow Mine shots is here is going to have a good opening engagement here. Is able to take out the first siege tank, going to try and focus the second one down with his stalkers. Will eventually clean that up. And I mean, overall, that's a pretty good trade here for Hero. I'm still liking Cure's position, but Hero taking out two of the three siege tanks here in the front line goes a long way towards buying him a little bit of breathing room for the next engagement. 
Ooh, big interception here. Are these Stalkers going to catch these Medivacs? Good distribution on the damage with that. And a pretty scrappy set of units here now. Uh, going to be set inside the main. And, and I just think Hero kind of basically has enough. I think he's done a perfect job of playing the interception game and shutting down reinforcements. And um, now I think that Cure has to leave. He's still looking strong, but he hasn't done any real damage. Yeah, I feel like there was more potential for damage there, there than Cure was able to get done. And, and I think just he almost he said, he Cure. almost made it too hard for himself by coming down on the low ground. I wonder if it's better to commit on an expansion. Yeah, I, I was expecting him to go push into the third base, but oh, hold that thought. Actually, Tastes is Cure. He's going for a doom drop right now. Four medevacs fully loaded here, coming into the main base of Hero. He's going to have to recall here, and that recall is going to come in here right now. Can he actually trap any of these medevacs and get them before they can leave? No blink forward. I think blink was actually on cooldown there. He used it earlier at that first engagement here. So those medevacs will be able to get out, but Cure, I mean, it feels like all these engagements, all these little tiny trades, he's bleeding out a little bit more army than Hero, and it was at one point, a pretty wide discrepancy between the power of these two forces, but it feels like Hero's been doing a really good job equalizing. Yeah, I think he's done a, a very good job with this. Let's see how this Widow Mine connects. It does do a lot of damage to those Zealots, a very unfortunate yeah. moment. I think Hero's set up a pretty good pin right now. He can kind of roam outside of this uh, natural expansion there in the second base for the Protoss. And then if the Protoss tries to chase him, he can pick back up and run into the main. Uh, and the result of that is the Terran set up a third base that's healthy, that hasn't really been touched once uh, in this game. And, you know, as much as Hero's holding these attacks off, he is ahead in supply. Yeah, Kira continuing to hold on to supply. Going to finally clean up this gateway. That was a long time coming. That gateway does get mopped up there over on the fourth base in here. It looks like he's gunning for an attack here with these charge locks. His charge lock count is really high. Cure not in the best position for this. He has some forces across the map. Storm's coming in right there. Cure was not anticipating that as all the Widow Mines are going to get cleaned up. But this bio loses a ton of HP. Now Hero sending the Zealots into the third base here for Cure, getting a lot of economic damage done as he's trying to zone away this army. But Cure coming in with the reinforcements. Huge attack in over here. It seems like the arc may be a little bit better for Cure. I don't think that Hero quite has enough. Some storms come down, but so many key units are picked off. And I do wonder now, could Cure actually seesaw this into a victory, taking out the third base on the other side of the map for Hero? I think he might be able to. I don't think Kiro realized exactly how much of Kiro's force was on the other side of the map. And so when those forces came back and reconverged with the forces there at the natural expansion, the arc was just massive. And Kiro, he's going to keep the momentum going right now. He does not want to slow down. He knows that he has to, that Kiro needs to make a magical play right happen. But no, the disruptor shot, not good enough. Kiro, 50 supply lead right now, pushing into the third base. Yeah, and I think that this is just enough to tip him over. Cure is going to be taking game one GG. Beautifully done. Um, and that means he's just one one away from now going on to the round of eight in this GSL. Very impressive stuff. And, you know, honestly, I think a very good mid-game play there from Cure. I mean, this is what he does with the best of them in the world is his army control in the mid game and in the late game just feels unstoppable. And for whatever reason, when you actually play against Kiro, you watch him play, it just feels like he has more stuff than other yeah. Terrans. I don't know what it is about him and his macro. It just feels like he always has more bio. And I mean, it's a testament to his skill that after that early push there with the Adepts and his natural expansion, he lost, I think, four four Marines. He lost a lot of mining time. He lost a handful of SCVs. There was a lot of damage done there by Hero, and Cure was still able to rebound in a big way and just swing the army supply advantage in his favor after Hero just had one slip up with Blink Stalker attack in the main. Yeah, and um, I think he played the map itself very well. We yeah. saw the Protoss expand up in a straight line. Um, and the fact that there's such a wide cavity at the bottom of the map outside the main, he can basically run up, try to pick off units that are reinforcing with any other push coming out of the map. He can pick up and go into the main and drop. Uh, and it, there were moments it seemed like actually Hero was playing like a little bit better. Right. But long term, it clearly was not enough. We never also saw Hero, and some of this could be down to the opening that Hero uh, played with. Didn't have a lot of the, the technical stuff that you're kind of building up to. In a PVT, you know, I mean, there's many ways to do it, but getting Immortals, 
um, getting some Archons, getting the Disruptors, sometimes getting the Colossus. Every game is different. But, you know, he went for the Adept play into the Stalker play, and that seemed to delay the building blocks that allow you to fight Terran pushes later on. So Kier kind of ran away with a bit of the game there when he was able to push and take that third and not really experience any pressure at all. And even with the Storms here, was able to drop there at the end. It did not, it was not enough. Let's see if Hero can fight back and force a set three as we load into map number two, Gresvin. DKZ Gaming, Hero. Club NV. Cure. Okay, game two is upon us. Cure has been playing, honestly, better than anybody else in GSL so far. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's like, just really come out flying right now. And, um, you know, we talked about it a couple times already, but it's worth mentioning again, I mean, Players are hungry now. It's GSL's, you know, is still the oldest standing esports tournament. Uh, we've had to reduce it in its size, but you know, this has kicked in a lot of motivation for these players. And Cure coming up here in a big way in Group E. I mean, I'm still impressed with how easily he was able to win the first TVZ of the day with yeah. some just, frankly, fantastic build order planning. I mean, that's really all it was. And it caught both of us by surprise, too. Yeah. It certainly caught Solar by surprise. And then you would think that, you know, Hero getting the advantage there early in game number one with the adept timing attack possibly is going to throw Kira off his game a little bit. But Kira, it felt like he didn't miss a beat. He just continued to keep on rolling, was able to easily deflect the Blink Stalker pressure that Hero tried to commit to, delaying a third base. And then Kira's like, okay, well, momentum is back in my favor. I'm going to push across the map. And even when he sieged into that third position, which we were a little bit skeptical about because he lost those siege tanks and it felt like it was a yeah. little of an overextension. Well, he, didn't, he didn't kill off the Cybernetics Core gateways or anything either. I think he wanted to force an engagement. But, I mean, it could have gone better for him, right, perhaps if we move into the third. But regardless of that, you know, the next army comes across the map for Kira, and it's even bigger. <laughs> right. And Hero just felt like he didn't have an answer for it. Well, he is so good at playing these games where um, he just, you know, there's nothing too fancy about it. He's just so solid in the matchup and, and kind of, again, I think some of this does go back to the play that um, Hero had back there, maybe a little bit too technical without actually getting that up done. It was adepts into um, uh, stalkers with blank. Into charge zealots and then into very late yeah. storm. Yeah, Archon, and so. the storm really wasn't doing anything, and it's like, okay, you, you might want to try to, you know, push some robo units out here or do something that's going to at least keep you safe. But that's also goes back to the way that Kira was playing, you know, like he kept the pressure on. Kira didn't really feel like he had the time or the resources to really take a third base and also tech up to those key units. He had to choose one or the other. Right. He went for the third base instead of teching up and just try to kind of go gateway mode, and it did not work out in his favor. But, you know, it's a new map right here. Hero, still the best Protoss player in the world. I mean, it's him and Max Pax, and then, I mean, I don't even know who I would put behind those two, breaking around the top. But I, I wouldn't expect Hero to have quite an easy time here. In map number two is the Reaper does get cleaned up. Hero's been, interestingly to me, favoring these low ground gateway walls here in PBTM. Yeah. Continually, like, seeing this rise in popularity and, I think it's cool. I, I like all these new things that Hero is, I mean, maybe not necessarily pioneering, because I don't think he's the first player to really do this, but really popularizing is kind of the leading figure for the Protoss race right now. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, by the way, this game is, is reaching back into very older standard play. Yeah. Uh, we've got a quick medevac coming up here. Um, over here for the Protoss, it was Three Gate Stalker. He's going to get that third Nexus up, and he's basically playing the defensive game of being ready to catch and intercept any kind of drop that would come forward. Um, we've got the Twilight Council coming here as well. A and um, I don't think we're going to have anything of major impact anytime soon here. Just one medevac with one Widow Mine inside <laughs> of it to see if he can get anything done. And I, I honestly can't imagine this will get much done. It's one of the most 
timid Widowmine drops I've ever seen. Yeah. There's only one of them in that medevac, man. <laughs> yeah, um, this is kind of funny to see that, you know, this is what's going to be coming out. Yeah, well, we'll see what it's able to get done. Widowmine does get burrowed here. We'll pick off two probes for its trouble before it gets cleaned up. Provide some space here for this Hellion, which is going to get... Well, we can line up another shot, actually. This is pretty good. I like this move here by Kira. I was wondering where that factory build time went. It went into that Hellion. And you know what? That's actually better than a two of mine drop. He sends in a Hellion, picks up, what, three or four more probes, gets six in total. That's a win. That was actually probably about as bare minimum as you could ever ask for, for a harass on a three base position. And he actually got more damage than he paid for to get the harass in. That's, so like, like, a, that's like a meal like a really fancy restaurant where it's like the tiniest possible plate. It's one Widow Mine and one yeah, Medivac yeah, yeah. and one Hellion. But it delivered, you know? And, and then there's was... a hair in it and it's free. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very delighted to see Kier pull that off. And so already um, Hero limping a little bit. Again, not the end of the world. We don't know who's going to take this game. But it was a good start uh, for Kier coming in. Yeah, nice, like, nice opening there. I like that we, mix of the Hellion and the. One we have a lot of these. Off. We have a lot of these games where it looks like, oh man, like they, you know, this guy's going so hard into this rush or this push is so dramatic and and, and that's so exciting. But a lot of times, it's like the very minimalist, uh, simple, uh, but cost-effective moments while you're racing ahead back at home can be even more impressive. And it's clearly very calculated, right? You send the one medevac. Protoss doesn't know how many Widow Mines are in there. He doesn't know what he has to prepare for. Right. Whoa. That's a lot Six of gates. gateways. Yeah, and I'm curious now to watch the probe count. Okay, it's still continuing to go up. So I think this might be Hero just trying to really lean into gateways, kind of similar to the way, similar to the way well, that he did in game number two, but just absolutely crush this push in its tracks. He's going up to 10 gateways in total. These stalkers right now are going to buy him a little bit of time here with some nice micro. He's got a rave in here. He has the uh, hero has the potential to set up a counter attack. Uh, if a push comes, I'm not sure if it actually is going to come by the way, but if it does, there's a lot of infrastructure out here at the front. So this could be a moment you just sort of win the fight there, and you know they can't produce anywhere near as much, especially not with the robo. I think it was six gates that were made inside the main base. Yeah, um, six or seven. So we're up to nine, maybe ten gateways right now for hero as the final gates are finishing up, and that push is going to come through here for cure. Charge, I think it's maybe about 15, 20 seconds away here for Hero. He's really going to want to warp in some Zealot to try and anchor his army and hold off this, this fight. And you can see him posturing here with the Stalkers. He's trying everything he can to buy time, but doesn't quite have vision for where Cure is maneuvering, and that might cost him. Yeah, and he's going to come out now. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like if anybody could hold the rush, it would be Hero with how many gateways he made, especially with the Stalkers coming in here to just intercept the push. These are some really good ideas uh, at play. He's going to siege up these tanks. He's got the armor shred out here. This The uh, wall is OK, but he does pick up and kind of get behind it. There is a lot here for Hero right now. There's a lot here for Hero, but there's a lot here for Cure as well. That's a lot of Widow Mines burrowed under that tank. This is going to be a very difficult position to bust with just gateway units, even if you can get the Zealots on top of it. Uh, Hero's going to need a really nice engage here, a nice arc. You can see him trying to set up for it, just barely skirting all these units right out of range of these siege tanks. And now the pressure's going to start here going for that shield battery first. Force field's coming in. We'll section oh. off some of this army. And actually, Hero with a big commitment, flicking in on the right side. The Zealots are going to come in. They are cleaning up a lot of those Widow Mines. But you just see oh. the damage potential here from Cure, as even though that was about the best engagement Hero could have hoped for, Cure just continuing to power through a 50 supply tasteless. This is wild. The tank was just far out enough. The Immortal had to try to commit to get in there and get it. The force fields at times working against Hero. We have Stutter Stop Micro coming down as the Zealots are going to be thinned out. Two disruptors are being made, but it seems like Hero is going to shove in over here. Yeah, Hero doing everything he possibly can to buy time for those disruptors to give him a little bit more space, but all this infrastructure, as you said, Tase, is right here at the front. One gateway already down, one robo down. There's now only one disruptor in production. More Zealots getting warped in, and Hero for now will be able to push this back a little bit, but. I feel like Kyrie is just going to start parade pushing this position. You see the army coming in on both sides. There is so much bio here. Yeah, this is pretty crazy. The disruptor's now out. It's going to fire a shot. It will whip, not hitting any major target. Kyrie can collapse in once more. I think that may be it. I think he's going to 2-0 hero here. 
and Kira just muscling his way through right now. And even if Hero is able to stabilize, which he might not be able to, Kira in such a commanding position. Excellent control, excellent game plan from start to finish here. 50 supply ahead of Hero as Hero is doing everything he possibly can to try and this, stay in this game. But I mean, having to just go for one Widowmine there with the Disruptor, you need bigger hits than that in this position. Yeah, and the Zealots come forward. He pulls back away. Just five Stalkers remaining over here. Uh, the, the third base is so vulnerable right now. The probes are now being massacred, and I just don't see enough complexity here on the side of Protoss things for there to be any way to recover. I think this is just about it. You can see Hero laughing a little bit to himself right there and shaking his head as he's starting to come to terms with the situation here is there really is no way for him ever to change the momentum back in his favor. I mean, look how many medevacs we have. We have more medevacs than Protoss units on the field. You're never going to kill this bio army. Yeah, it's funny. There's always just enough medevacs here with energy that the healing, the sustain is going to continue on. One more disruptor comes out. The shot, not good enough. And now he can pounce on that Robo. GG, Cure 2 O's Hero in a shockingly one-sided series. Yeah, I was expecting this to be a really competitive match, but man, Cure came to play today. You saw that not only in match number one, but also in match number two here against Hero. Back-to-back -back solid games. I love the game plan there. I mean, coming with a one Widow Mine and the Medivac and the Hellion gets him a little bit of economic momentum. And then the attacks come in and it's kind of reminiscent of game one where he fortified that one position outside of where the cybernetics core was, the initial gateway, that pylon there in Hero's base. And Hero, he feels like he has to engage. And I mean, honestly, he does with his gateway style, yep. but Cure just takes his fights so well. He is so good at controlling these units in these tough situations. I got to say, I I'm blown away. Cure is our first player in group B to advance. Hero, of course, is not eliminated. Uh, and up next, we're going to have the losers match. Yeah, Coming losers match is going to be next. Is you know these players fighting for their tournament life here in GSL? As we're already in the round of 16, they desperately want to make it to round of eight in the offline portion. Oh, I can't use words right now. You're suddenly. fine. Offline portion of this tournament. It's been crazy so far. Great games. Um, Keen vs. Solar is going to be up next. Uh, so we have a TVZ for you guys. Interview time here with Kira. Let's see how he's feeling. Here, congratulations. Thank you. Your condition was great today. How do you feel? The match against Solar, I put my prep in. It paid off. I guess I had a lot of momentum uh, after that victory. You said you had an easy victory against Solar with your prep, but it also seems like versus Hero, it wasn't that difficult either. Well, I didn't have a ton of different builds to use against Hero. He also, Hero also used builds he doesn't use that often today. So Hero's build for me personally, it wasn't very difficult to, to manage. So I think that's why I came out on top and victorious. So you had a game like that on Babylon. I thought I had a low chance to win versus him on that. I think it's just I was able to eke out more damage with fights over time. I think that carried me. Wasn't really sure he was going to be using that build. I didn't quite catch that. It sounds like um, he didn't really anticipate Hero using these builds, but was able to win with them anyway. He said, if I remember correctly, Rain used some builds like that earlier this year in an earlier tournament. Dark likes to use roaches a lot against Terran, but Solar didn't. Let's talk about the two racks Reaper build. 
He says, even though GSL got smaller, uh, this has always been the most important tournament to me. I'm always going to do my best, uh, so please keep supporting me. That does it for the interview. All right. Good to hear from our winner here in Group B. He thought the microphone was real? <laughs> yeah, GYP. All right, I'm going to gonna break the fourth wall here. These chains are not really floating behind <laughs> us, okay? This may look like an upgrade. Like, wow, they bought giant silver chains. There must be just bodybuilders <laughs> holding them on either side, competing, pulling them. Competing, competing in some kind of vacuum. Yes, it's a game of tug of war <laughs> with giant chains behind us. Those no. are the, the chains we used to control those robots, man. That's right. Unless the they... Android at the start of the show, also not real. Um, um, anyways, guys, your support on Patreon is appreciated. Uh, how could he have thought the microphone was real? Yeah, I, 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 That's I don't the know. funniest thing that's happened this whole season. Yeah. Even the producers in my ears <laughs> going like, what? what? How could he think that? Even our producers digging into chain It's just crazy right to me. Yeah. Now the headsets are real. All yeah, right. These so are real. watch out. Chains are not real. I feel like we need to list the things that are real and aren't real here. That's GSL. <laughs> Poor yeah, JYP. We gotta help him out. He man. really put himself out on the line there, and, and he paid for it. <laughs> That's brutal. That's embarrassing. Um, um, okay. Well, uh, that does it for our winners match. Cure uh, is the first survivor. That leaves us with Hero going into the losers match. Solar versus Keen is next. Of course, we will be eliminating one of those players depending on who loses. Um, and let's go to break. We'll be right back.
드디어 카운트다운을 시작합니다. 4, 3, 2, 1 떴다. 제로 칼로리로 기분까지 가볍게. 밀키스 제로. 我们来看一下我们的两位选手。首先，我们来看一下我们的两位选手。首先，我们来看一下我们的两位选手。首先，我们来看一下我们的两位选手。首先，我们来看一下我们的两位选手。首先，我们来看一下我们的两位选手。首
in that area. Yeah. You know, instead of trying to you know play around weaknesses. Uh, and it was cool to see him do this really uh, great macro game to start the day off against of all people Hero, where I feel like Hero is probably the scariest player to play a macro game against because he just sets up to punish that so easily. Certainly. And even if you try to cheese Hero, he's probably already doing something weird to start. So you're going to probably not get to execute what you want to do. Yeah, or at least not to plan because a lot of things can go quickly awry against Hero, particularly in that matchup too. I mean, TPP against Hero, one of the scarier matchups and player matchups that exists in StarCraft 2 today in the entire pro scene. And no, Solar, another one of those Zergs that kind of has a quite aggressive play style at times. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some pushes coming out of Solar here against Keen. Uh, we didn't really get to see exactly what Solar's game plan is in DBT coming into today with just how kind of rapidly Kira was able to close the walls in on him in the first series. So I'm excited to see what he has in store for us. Yeah, and to start things off, um, look, it's just a Reaper scout here. The third command center has started. Uh, so that's going to give us a real idea of, of kind of what he's got in store, uh, which is really just macro at this point in time. Now, Solar's somebody where if he can spot this is happening, sometimes he does do something crazy and cheesy. That might be maybe a couple of years ago. He might have decided to be a bit more conservative in the past, uh, you know, around now. But let's see if he can scout this. It's not the hardest command center to find. It's kind of sticking out on the edge if you were to get an Overlord over there. Yeah, I'm trying to look at the mini-map and see exactly where the Overlords are positioned. I don't think he has anything. Nothing near. Yeah, nothing near that. I don't see him potentially getting, um, well, I, guess, I guess he might go for Overlord Speed to get a full scout, but, you know, against a player like Keen, and I mean, I don't mean this as a dig at Keen in any way, but Solar is just such a solid macro Zerg that if he's able to just kind of play his own game and play conserved and defensively back at home, I mean, he's going to be feeling confident here against Keen, not only in this map, but in this series. So, you know, this third CC, it might just go unscouted. Solar might be like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, Play more safely at home. I'm not going to spend all these this money on you know Overlord speed or anything like that. Right. Just try to focus on getting my queen count up, trying to build up the sort of defense that can come against anything. And if my opponent gets away with a greedy third CC, it's okay. I can still play that game. There, there are ways to approach the game where you're you're not that concerned. You kind of have a a, a, a well-rounded approach to, to everything overall. Um, he is going to send this Overlord up here and try to see what he can't find. It is going to get spotted with the Viking, so he's going to commit in. He's not going to get any further intel. The command center is way far out. If you can get deep enough in there and then you see that, you know, the rest of those barracks are also making, then you can tell just by seeing that those aren't finished yet that there must be a command center uh, that was made. But I don't think he got in there and really got that figured out. Um, so, I mean, we'll see, um, you know, what exactly a Solar's going to do. It's hard to say if he's behind or not, because Terran's not going to attack out just yet. Yeah, and I think for Solar also, seeing the Viking out like that also tells you that Keen's not going to be playing hyper-aggressively, because the, the Viking doesn't really mesh well with many attacking units here in TBZ. It's more about scouting denial. Yeah, so. it's like, I don't want you to see what I'm doing. Yeah. Like, All right, well, like, you know. Like, think back to the, the games that we saw Byun play in Group A, and if you went for a Viking instead of a Medivac in some of those games when he wants to do those big Marine pushes, like, that just doesn't work straight up. So Solar doing a couple big rounds of drones after seeing that Viking. He's going to have a good idea of what's going on here for Keen in just a moment with that third CC going down to get planted. And Keen, it looks like he's happy just to continue to power up back at home. He's going for 1-1 one, one upgrades, third CC now planned, just playing a nice, slow game. Yeah, it's going to be a quiet game to start things off. It looks like we might have the first little bit of action here as the two medevacs are going to come across the map and try to uh, maybe kill some creep, but obviously this isn't going to be any real commitment. Uh, one Link does kill one SCV back there. Um, and we're seeing the balancing act now from the Zerg of trying to drone up as much as possible while having a responsible enough amount of roaches to, to not die, to not take a, a true beating here. Uh, is the Terran actually going to go into the main now? It looked like he was pointed up in that direction. I think so. He should be popping into that main at any moment. Solar right now playing a more roach heavy style, only has 10 links. So it might take him a minute to get here into the main base and actually stop this drop. We'll see if Keen's able to get any drone kills, but no, Solar with a lightning quick reactions there, pulling every single drone away, even the drone that was still mining that gas. So no drone losses here, just a little bit of lost mining time. Yeah, the roaches are moving in a very single file fashion, which is making them a little bit clunky against the Marines. They ultimately do get up there close enough in time. They kill off about one medevac worth of 
uh, units. The infestation pit and the banelings nest come down. Uh, Zerg is now on four bases, the fourth being taken at 12 o'clock. Uh, the third base is kicked in now for Kane, and so we're going to start to get into the macro phase where Terran's going to be looking for opportunities to try to come out and take a fight, and the Zerg is going to start to wane off of droning and instead go into upgrading, tacking, and making attacking units. Yeah, and I think that pressure is probably going to start to mount once all of these key upgrades come in for the Terran bio armies. Right now, he's still just powering up at home. He's trying to find some damage here with these Marines, and actually, this is a nice attack over here on the left side. I missed this on the mini-map. Wodomai's getting in position here, going to try and deflect these links. Actually, a lot of splash damage coming in on those Marines, and they get cleaned up. Yep, so he's going to take this infantry out now. Um, and, you know, it's not really making that much of a dent. The supply is starting to spike up. Now, remember that when you see roaches in a game, um, you know, they're going to always be ahead in supply, but they're not roaches being made right now. Uh, so we see those roaches are out, but he's already actually droning up, making a lot of lings and getting everything else out here. So this is a pretty substantial lead. Keen has not fully pushed yet. He's just been dropping and harassing. But it looks... Uh-oh. Oh, uh Have a pause here. So Keen okay. perhaps with some technical problem. And um, we'll see if we can get that sorted in just a moment. But yeah, with the way things have um, been standing so far, I, I like Solar's position more. Keen is going for a lot of you know different drops, but hasn't really been able to get too much damage done so far. Yeah. And at the same time, he's been bleeding out a lot of Marines. And I mean, usually the way these things go, if you're going to play this kind of macro bio heavy style is you really want to snowball that bio count so that you can take these big trades and set up arcs and you know pull away, split f away from the banelings. But Losing Marines like that, it takes a little bit of the oomph out of your army, so... Yeah, well, it's it's like you're trading Marines for Roaches. Like, this doesn't really do anything. And the Roaches are basically like a, a, a stopgap for the rest of the tech. I mean, they're, they're, they're there to soak damage so that the Zerg can finish teching up and taking the rest of the map. Uh, it looks like they're probably going to be on pausing in a moment once our ref says it's okay. So whatever the issue was, uh, it's been resolved. But uh, we are seeing these drops not really have the kind of impact I think they have to have if the the way that Terran ultimately wins almost every TVZ, which is with a push, usually that's on the back of all these successful drops that have killed drones, that have destroyed tech, and, and, and uh, you know, done you name it. But n certainly not what we've seen from uh, Keen so far. All right, so we are back in the game now here. Keen going to continue to push forward with this bio ball in the middle of the map as we start to get our bearings here again on Royal Blood. And Keen, losing no momentum here with that pause, is going to be attacking over here into the third base of Solar. Not able to find too much damage, though. Just trading out a little bit of bio for some Zerg units, but... I yeah, mean, again, it's, a, it's the same idea. Um, <laughs> can he come in here and actually, you know get much done, or are you just going to trade out infantry? He's going to drop down here once more. The trades up until this point have been pretty good, but if these medevacs start to fall and all of the bio gets cleaned up, I mean, only, what, four or five units getting out of that? It's not the best possible trade there for Keen. It's also not the worst. It's just not, you know, building the momentum that you really want here as Terran. You want to start to slow down the Zerg and prevent them from playing their game, but Solar, he's happily been able to get up to, I mean, what's soon going to be 85 drones without too much of a dent in his ego at all. Oh, God, even takes out that. <laughs> like Medivac at the last second. <laughs> so just so you guys know, um, the, the screen is frozen right now for, for Keen. His Discord crashed, so that's why. He's not very still when he plays uh, or anything like that. hyper-focused right now, yeah. Tasteless. <laughs> he's statue-like <laughs> at this moment. Um, so... Yeah, we see the roaming. Now, the good thing uh, is that even though there's not a lot of damage getting done here from Keen, he is actually expanding at a pretty scary rate. He's taking two more bases, both Ooh. towards the bottom center. There's another attack coming up over here towards 12 o'clock that we're about to catch over here on camera. And we're starting to get some real damage in here for Keen. You know, at first it was kind of slow and trades were quite even, but being able to kill a hatchery over there on the left side also killed the spawning pool. Right now, Solar, he can't make links and he can't research Adrenal, which is something he desperately wants to do. So he's going to pull away from this position, but you know, got to hand it to him. The past, couple few, the past couple drops have been very effective. Yeah, it was like things were not going great until suddenly they were. And let's say that these drops can remain active and basically be a big distraction right now. Um, for, for Solar, Solar's not going to have any way to come across the map and take out these fresh bases. And if Keen can basically just stay ahead of bases for a few minutes, he'll just win this game. And 
doing a really good job of using the terrain here on Royal Blood to his best advantage is Keen as he just continually harasses that critical fourth base there for Solar. And now coming with a bio on the left side. Actually, some missed micro there from Solar. Some drones were pulled by accident. Army also out of position, and the third hatch is going to go down. And Tace, I can feel the momentum swinging now in Keen's favor as he just continuously takes good trades. Yeah, I mean, this is looking so strong so far. He's continuing to kite. I got to say, uh, I almost don't believe my eyes the fact that Keen, you know, it started out kind of lackluster, and now the game of catch up is really starting to happen. But. The medevacs are beginning to get cleaned up. I don't see a lot more units out on the map. I don't see SCVs at that last base we just looked at. Um, yeah, it, 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 the question, I guess, is going to be, can Solar find some counterplay? Yep, another drop here in the main base will get cleaned up as those Vipers take care of the medevacs. But Keen, he is not going to stop the pressure now coming through the main base. And this is one of the full, or one of the only full mining bases here for Solar. It's going to quickly get sniped down by this heavily upgraded bio army. And I mean, Solar right now, he has 89 workers, but he doesn't really have any place to mine. His income, it's starting to dwindle here I, from this pressure by Keen. I feel like he's just lost. I feel like Keen was actually just playing such a better game, you know, getting like 2%, then 5%, then 10% ahead. Um, and we're looking at a Zerg that's on four bases. Now, Zerg is still fighting back. The supplies are still somewhat even, but like, you're not supposed to be even on bases, uh, you know, if, if you're Zerg. You're supposed to be ahead. You actually have to be ahead or you're basically behind. So the game's whole uh, economy is designed that the Zerg has to basically get more of the map. Uh, and now we see a bunch of Banes getting shut down. And, you know, when you start to lose Banes like that, especially if the Ultimus gets shoot away, you don't really have anything that can actually obliterate large chunks of infantry. Yeah, this army might just be too much as the reinforcements are coming in here for Solar, but... They're coming in, in just bits and pieces, and Keen is just continuously parade pushing across the map. And this army here is still fighting. I thought for sure that would get cleaned up at least a little bit, but we might just see Keen overpower Solar here in the middle of the map. This is inspiring play here from Keen. I, I can't believe it. GG, he did it. Keen, I mean, no wonder he was able to hang with Hero. Yeah. He's just playing the straight up style. Uh, he is, camera's frozen, by the way. <laughs> I guarantee you he's a little bit happier with that win than he looks on screen. Called Medusa on his Discord, and now he's frozen <laughs> forever. Um, but yeah, it feels like, uh, at least in that game, it, it felt like for a long time the two of them were kind of like doing this dance, like playing tango, and Solar was, yeah. you know, right there in lockstep, and he was able to hold on to anything Keen threw his way until suddenly he wasn't. And Keen did not let the pressure stop. He just kept mounting it. He would parade push. He would go for drops in different sections of the map. He would yep. go for not only hatcheries, but also for critical infrastructure. I mean, taking out that spawning pool when it's researching adrenal glands and Solar desperately wants to get more lings out on the map for map control was huge. And Keen just able to play about as straight up a macro game as it possibly gets. I mean, really fast 3cc, going for a fast double engineering bay as well, going for the 4th cc behind the pressure. It's funny because, like, Look, I've been casting Keen for so long, and I'm kind of used to, to where I have seen him at, and he's good, okay? He looks way better than I have casted him, uh, or, or the games I have cast of him is what I'm trying to say. Uh, he is actually just kind of outmaneuvering Solar. And by the way, it looked like a rough start. It wasn't like Solar, you know, got hurt by the first big drop. Sometimes we have games where, like, they just miss where the drop is, and, like, that's enough damage that it starts to compound. Uh, in this game, Solar was doing a very good job at playing defense. We were even talking about it before the pause that this doesn't really look good. You know, he's trading Marines for Roaches, which is kind of what the Zerg wants. But he just kept juggling. He kept throwing enough problems out there that the Zerg couldn't keep up. And when he started to destroy the hatcheries, that's where we saw, okay, there's actually a possibility this might just be Solar getting flushed out. Yeah, we just reached a breaking point and Solar suddenly was not able to put out any of the fires that were getting created. And I'm loving what we're seeing out of Keen today. He looked very good in the first macro game that he played against Hero. And game number two, it was a little bit less shaky. I mean, he did get unlucky there, not having energy for scans to deal with the DTs, and that just yeah. sent the game off the rails. But Keen, when he gets to play his macro game, he is looking solid in multiple matchups right now. I was very impressed with that. You know, we started that game, and I was talking about how Maybe if I'm Solar, if I put myself in Solar's shoes, I'm just going to play a conservative game because I feel like if it goes late, if I get to macro up the way yeah. that I want to comfortably, I'm going to win. But 
Maybe now I'm not so sure because Keen, he looked on point. He did, he looked very good. Keen's camera's still frozen. Probably will stay frozen until we go to our commercial break. Whether that Keen wins or not, I don't know, but um, Keen with the problems with the camera. Discord emotes coming up, the camera's <laughs> crashing, but it's working. <laughs> It's his, it's working it's for his him. mojo, it's, man. Yes, that's what he He's needs. He's stealing it from Discord and injecting it into his veins. Yes. It's giving him the power he needs to win as we go to match point here. Guangdong Freaks, Keen. Onside Gaming, Solar. Okay, so. Um, we're going on into this game, and um, I, I would not be surprised if Keen just plays another ordinary. And when I say ordinary, I, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. No, it's. But I mean, like you know, what, what Keen's doing are like builds you teach your friend who's already pretty good at the game and just needs like a like maybe he plays Protoss or Zerg, and you're like, okay, you want to learn Terran, do this build. Right. And it's, just macro up, and you'll, you'll get the hang of the matchup over time. It's like vanilla ice cream, but really good vanilla ice cream. Yeah, really like, high quality. Very high quality. You could taste the vanilla beans in there. It's chocolate, but it's like the best chocolate <laughs> you've ever had. <laughs> yeah, it's simple, but it's good. And Keen actually, here on match point, already throwing down that command center. We got a CC first, I think. I mean, oh, Keen, yeah, yeah, I you're right. Yeah. liking this play from him. By the way, different approaches here with our two Terrans today from Cure to Keen. Oh, that's true, yeah. I mean, it really, it's, it's one of the things you can celebrate about StarCraft is that the different play styles do require just such different approaches. So, you know, there's so many ways to come in here and try to play with a race. Now, um, in this game, it's Command Center first. This was popular last year. Um, I want to say, like, season two of last year, this was, like, I think we saw this more often than we didn't, but I don't know that we saw it with double gas. Yeah, I don't recall exactly. I mean, I don't know the exact build order from this. Uh, you know, normally I watch for the, if it's, okay, it's a command center first, then I watch and see if there's a third command center that's going to be made. Right. Um, I would expect Keen, just given the way that he's played today, that he is going to go for a third command center, perhaps behind a little bit of tech considering he has those two gases. Yeah, I mean, maybe he wants to tech up. I'm, I'm almost wondering, like, could there be any kind of mech play? Because we already saw that with Cure today. True. You know, the thing about a, a quick command center is it doesn't really dictate that you have to do anything specifically after that. No, it's These, just pure greed. Yeah, it's a greedy opener that when you get away with it, you go, well, all right, you're like, you know, you're, you're um, uh, you know, a few seconds ahead in this race. And that means a lot in RTS is, you know, things all build off of each other. Uh, but... Yeah, I, I look at this and I go, okay, so what kind of game do you want to play? I see the factory coming. Um, and I want to know, is it going to be another command center? Is it going to be some kind of two-base powering play? Does he throw down a bunch of barracks after this? Um, and I don't think we've had command center first into two factory mech. Or if we did, I just don't remember it. Yeah, I don't remember a game that went exactly like that. But we'll see exactly what happens. Is Solar actually with... Just one Ling? Perhaps it was two coming in here and getting an SCV kill and a full scout. So he should know by the timings that this is CC first, and that should have a good read on exactly what Keen is capable of doing as the Reaper finally does come back to clean that up. And just going to be a 1-1-1 one, one, one opening here for Keen. Marine in production. I like this a lot from Keen. It looks like, uh, you know, especially if the Zerg isn't going to attack you at all outright, you're going to get all your tech up. It's still ambiguous as far as what the Terran's plans are, which I think makes the Zerg a little bit stressed out. Sometimes if you see a very greedy quick expand, it's almost nice to see them then try to attack you right after it because you kind of know what you're up against. We're here, it's still not clear. We don't have any overlords close enough to check for the third command center, uh, which is not down yet, but instead it's going to be tech that's going in, you know, nicely in a couple different directions. Ooh, and it's going to be Cloak Banshee with Hellions. Yeah, very cool. Okay. Yeah, Keen mixing it up a little bit. And, you know, if he came into today with this kind of a game plan of showing some pretty conservative macro games and then switching it up halfway through the day, that could be a kind of good approach here as... I like it. You know, for, for Solar, I mean, you just played against 3CC Greed. Keen played a very clean macro game, was able to beat you in that game. And now to see... Keen go CC first and follow that up with Cloak Banshee here. It might catch him by surprise. Looks like this Overlord is going to be picked off. So he's not going to get that, that important intel. 
that would let him know exactly what he's up against. So the ambiguity is, is huge right now. Um, oh, I guess he did get a little bit of vision in that. Yeah, I think that was from the Zergling earlier, but okay. he doesn't know exactly okay. what the setup doesn't is here. see what here. it is now, yeah. Yeah. Because you, you see those that, that set of buildings, there's so many different things it could be depending on what you attach to what um, add-on. Yeah, the way that you can configure that with all the potential different add-ons, all the unit compositions you can go for, it's, it's crazy. And we now have a healthy number of Hellions here, I think seven on the field, roving towards Solar's side of the map. Going to see if they can control the creep spread just a little bit here, pot potentially even get some drone kills. There aren't too many Lings here, but Keen playing nice and conservatively, only goes for two there as Solar was for a moment attacking his own extractor. The um, double eBay is going to be finishing up. So this is going to be just your standard bio. Just a very, very strong setup. Um, we don't have the fourth base yet for Solar. I think some of this might have been him holding back because he's not totally sure what he's up against. And let's not forget, the loss against Cure in game two is probably still echoing in the mind of Solar. True. Where he just sort of didn't have a read in the mid game and just died outright. That actually has happened a couple times so far uh, in this season of GSL where it's like, like when um, we saw Bion just move across the map and just kill the Zerg right away, where it's, he's like, oh, I'm just not ready. Um, and so that is, might have delayed his, his fourth base, which, you know, long term, if you don't get your fourth base up in time, you're in a weaker position later on. Terran's already landing his third. We did have the Spire start for the Zerg as well. Yeah, so Solar opting for the Spire here and now coming in with his Overseer. Does get zoned away a little bit by Keegan and now here at 6.30. This is kind of late, but this might catch Solar by surprise again. These two Banshees coming in. There is a Spore Crawler in position, but he, if he plays this right, should be able to get a good number of drone kills. Five already to start things out. Now moving to the third base, we'll see what he's able to find. Yeah, I like the roaming. I think this is a, a cool way to, to handle this, to come in here and get some free kills. And, you know, it's not that easy to catch these Banshees. I think he should be able to get this one since uh, I think that was maybe a little Woo. bit too of, uh, <laughs> yeah, too okay. confident there to actually go up from the main in between the, the third and then into the second. Yeah, hugging that corner a little bit too tight there, and that Banshee does get taken down. But So there's a lot of Mutas coming here, and, and I think this might catch Keen off guard, and this may be the ace up the sleeve here for Solar because Roaches are one thing. You don't normally – fight Roach and then Muta with Ling and Bane. Yeah, it's very gas intensive to go from Roaches into Mutalisk, so he might not be anticipating this, especially coming in here with these Roaches and Lings already engaging. I'm not sure actually if he got confirmation of the Spire with the Banshees. Were you I don't able think to he see did. that? I don't think he did. Okay, well, I, he knows now. <laughs> well, he wouldn't have been out this far if he had known Mutas were going to be a play because the idea is that you're oh, such a good body block with the Queens. Yeah. Because the idea is that if there are no mutas, you could pick up endlessly and run away and sort of, you know, uh, uh, build up damage. But I think Solar with a pretty genius muta play blindsides Keen. Now, Keen is massing up Marines, so this isn't going to be uh, a threat long term, but it is going to be a pretty big interruption to the momentum he's had so far. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for Keen to kind of retain his forces on the map because Ravager Ling Bane seems to be the composition of choice right now here for Solar, and that packs a punch. There are a lot of situations where you might find yourself in a position where you think you're safe, and then you realize you've actually overextended moving out in the middle of the map. And if you do that normally, just as you said, you pick up in the Metavax, you go back home, everything is gravy. But here with these Mutalisks out on the field, it's a little bit more dangerous. So Keen instead going to play conservative, safely back at home, morph these Hellions into Hellbats. Build that fourth CC, not on the expansion, but back by the natural where he can expand, where he can defend it. And for now, just continue to power up. He's got 2-2 two -two coming, as well as that fourth CC, adding in three more barracks, a second factory. Gearing up for that late game. Yeah, I, I, I do think that Solar's in a very good spot. I think he kind of shut down the nice setup that, that Keen had here. Uh, now the Mutas again not that much of a threat for that much longer but the question is is can solar then flip this into some tech that is going to be able to fight this uh the creep is actually pretty good maybe not so great in the middle after he wiped that out but top and bottom on the map it, it is looking pretty strong yeah there's a lot of different avenues you got to spread your creep on here at Gresvin. so solar doing a good job of that as keen coming in with a clutch scan will catch the hive timing as it just starts to morph i believe he might have seen 
Actually, I'm not sure what that one saw. Was there a Hydralis stand in the main base there for Zerg? I could oh, swear there, I had a there glimpse There might of it. have been. I mean, he might just not be making out of that yet. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. All right, Solar coming in here. Has a nice favorable trade there with some good Baneling connections. And these Mutas just continuing to provide value right here. This Medivac's going to have to unload, and these units are all but dead. And Zerg is really starting to grow into uh, their side of the map. Oh, it was a Hydralist then. Man, Solar is really filling out his entire tech tree. He's getting Roaches, he's getting Ravagers, Bailing, yeah. some Mutalisks. Now, Hydralisks, he's in a pretty comfortable spot. Really, all Zerg tools at his disposal as he comes in. He might have overextended coming out of the third base ramp as Solar just attacks into this position. And at the end of the day, Keen will be able to survive, but he lost a lot of bio, a lot of critical units there, some siege tanks going down too. Going to try and get some momentum back by cleaning up creep here at the twelve, at the 6 o'clock position. Yeah, this is some pretty good creep cleaning, to be honest with you. Solar's had to really go back and lick his wounds. That being said, he is maxed out. He's going to have a real uh, threat of an army that I think is not going to be easy to engage with. We're starting to see Keen get pushed away uh, at both the bottom and the middle. Keen is continuing to expand and looking good in that front. Um, but Solar's doing his job. He's taking over the entire right side of the map and continuing to grow. Yeah, and it seems like Solar just continuously wants to trade here while he's maxed. He doesn't want to play the game where he's just trying to bank a bigger and bigger stockpile of resources. He wants to trade these out because, you know, he's figuring that Keen isn't at max yet. Otherwise, Keen would probably be more active on the map already. So, you know, Solar just kind of consuming the map on his side, doing a good job of also rebuilding these creep tiers as we get a quick look at the units lost there. A lot of losses on both sides as Keen just continuing the pressure, a little bit reminiscent of the last game. Yeah, the only difference between this game and the last game is I don't think we've seen Keen find his edge. We've been in this game for 11 minutes and 30 seconds, which means it's going to be not easy. Oh, hold on a second. A lot of Banes coming forward. All right, trades out pretty nicely. 2-2 two -two about to finish here for the Zerg. And yeah, you know, we haven't seen Keen find that moment where he's really getting opportunities, but he is continuing to build up pressure here in the middle of the map. The Siege Tank line is looking really scary. I don't think these Banes should be coming this far forward. Yeah, Bailing's going a little bit off creep, not getting the best possible connections there. But again, this is Solar leveraging his massive economy and his base lead with 85 drones and just trading out resources once he reaches max. It might not be the best trade he could possibly take. It might not be optimal, but it still gives him an edge because now Keen, he's only down to 165 supply. Yeah, and I think if Solar's going to win this long term, he just has to keep the supply oppressed uh, for... Keen. He just has to basically keep that low enough. Ooh, that a big attack coming in, Tasteless. Ooh. Those vials on those siege tanks bunched up is just chef's kiss as all three tanks get blasted. And Solar with a big step here in the middle of the map. Keen absolutely overstating, overstaying his welcome after the last engage. And we might see Solar ride this momentum into a win. Yeah, he may have actually done it. I think he traded really nicely. He needs to go back, uh, remake that, obviously. Ravager's never great at retreating against units that are stemmed here, but we saw the minerals plummet and the supply spike back up for Solar. Yeah, and these are adrenal lings that he's pumping out. So once this army, you know, fully reforms with banelings, with lings, with hydralisks, and Solar comes in for the next attack, unless Keen is poised in the most defensive posture possible, it's going to be hard for him to hold on. I mean, the supply really tells the tale right now. Almost a 50% supply lead and army here for Solar as he is gunning for a fight. Yeah, uh, this is going to be a tough next few minutes for Keen. He really got beaten back. It, it, it's, it's a funny thing. If you can stay max and just keep hitting, you're probably going to win more and more and more. And we saw Keen almost drop below 100 supply. A lot of times when you see them drop below 100 of supply, that's like where they're probably close to being killed off here. Yeah. You can see the bases are falling in the process of this attack, which makes catching back up to the Zerg very, very difficult. And this may be just a classic ZVT victory where it's just about getting to where you need to be and then leaning on the, the Terran until they can't take it anymore. Yeah, Solar's economy is overpowering right now, and Keen, he's trying his best to hold on. He wants to keep his GSL hopes alive, and does not want to go to a match point 1-1 one, one here. He's going to give it everything he possibly has, but Solar just so powerful right now. These Adrenal Lings continuing to flood in. Liberator's trying to get up in position, but it's not going to be enough. Solar takes game number two, and we're on match point here. Solar looking very stoic.
I'm sorry, I'm going to say Keen looking stoic after that win. I messed my joke up. So, Solar wins that. Um, oh, there's still a little dog. Oh, she's got two dogs. No, oh, bring Go the back dogs to the back. Go camera. No. There's two dogs over here as well. Um, <laughs> look, that was a very impressive game from Solar. Yeah, Solar looked really good. I mean, after Keen's game one against Hero, which, you know, admittedly he did lose that match, he still looked solid. And then game one against Solar. When he was allowed to just kind of play his macro game and just, you know, drop everywhere, parade push when he can, he looked really strong. So for Sora to kind of bounce back here in game two and not let things spiral out of control the same way they did in the previous map, yeah. I think that's going to be a boon of confidence for him coming into match three because keep in mind, the loser of this series is out of the GSL code. They're dead, yeah. And uh, if we kill him, <laughs> <laughs> the floor opens up, they go, ah, it's over. Um, Look, I mean, we we had, um, I think, a lot of really bad games from Solar to start this off. Yeah. O2 with Kier, and Kier just murders him. It's like, Kier's like, watch this, and his strategy just works in the first couple minutes of him actually showing it to his opponent. And then we saw Keen play a crazy game where he just out macroed Solar, and I'm thinking, all right, is Solar just not in the shape we're used to seeing um, him be in? Excuse me. But he has come back. He's played nicely there. Um, but again, Keen has shown us that he can win, so I think this is a tough one to call. Yeah, Keen's shown that he's comfortable in a lot of different situations. I mean, he's been able to hang with the best of them so far here in deep macro games. We'll see if he gets to play that game again here to get ready to go into map number three on Babylon. Both these players desperately needing a win to face Hero in the final match of Group B and advance to the round of eight. Their tournament life's on the line here. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Babylon is where it will be settled. Who gets eliminated? Who gets to give us this exciting match versus Hero? This cure is our only survivor for tonight. So far. Guangdong Freaks, Keen. Onside Gaming, Solar. I was almost hoping that Keen would just completely turn this on its head and go for a proxy three rex. Here. Yeah, I was I was thinking that myself. I'm like, come on, now's your time. Uh, but no, just gonna be safe and standard supply depot there on the high ground. We'll see if he goes for a CC first again too. No, it's just gonna be a barrack. So yeah, better openings here. I mean, the, the CC first was cool. It does seem like we had more success when people just two base rushed. Yeah, I don't know it. why that fell so hard out of fashion. I, I mean, feel it, like it must be something where everybody online like just started stopping it. Yeah, sometimes we see metas kind of shift in online tournaments or just an online ladder and yeah. not really at the live events. And then we're kind of like left scratching our heads like, okay, that worked for like six games in a row and Terran won every single time convincingly. Yeah. Why doesn't anybody try it like once now? But yeah, haven't seen too many. CC first in the two base all in TBZ plays in quite a while. Not going to see it today. Is Keen now fighting for his life here against Solar and keep in mind Solar and Dark. We've only played through one group, but Solar and Dark are the only two remaining Zergs here in the GSL Code S. If Solar loses this map, Dark in Group C is going to be the only Zerg standing heading into, I mean, the latter half of the round of 16, but also the round of eight. It's kind yeah, of crazy. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I kind of forgot because, you know, we've already casted some good games from Zerg already. But, yeah. like, you're right. That doesn't have to be the case coming forward here. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think Solar and Dark are two guys that could and should probably survive to the round of eight. But, you know, here we are. And it's 1-1 one, one versus Keen, which isn't exactly a great sign. And the winner goes what, on to play Hero, too. <laughs> yeah, which – and I do think Hero is the most likely one to win against both of these two anyways. Um this always happens at the, at the start of a new year for GSL, though. We do need a little bit of time to evaluate where the players are at. We have the off season for StarCraft, and then we got to come back and be like, okay, so, you know, what have you been doing in the in the weeks and months we haven't seen you play? Yeah, a lot of these guys have been absolutely grinding it in online matches since Katowice, leading up to GSL Code Asses. Some very cute micro there by Keen. I think the game count for some of the players, I can't recall who. I know Hero was grinding. I think he played something like 300 plus maps in total in tournament play since Katowice, which is just absolutely crazy. Yeah. I think Cure might be one of those other players that's been grinding, but 
you just know that these players right now, they are giving it their absolute best. They're giving it their all. A lot of people, when they heard that GSL and StarCraft Esports as a whole was downsizing a little bit, mm -hmm. were concerned about the level of competitive play. But I've got to tell you, from the matches that we've seen so far at GSL, and not only in GSL, but in tournaments, both online and offline around the world, it doesn't really feel like you know, the co competition is slowing down at all. I mean, the prize money, it might not be what it used to be, but these players, they're playing their hearts out for it. Yeah, the games have been just incredible. It's been it's been really fun to see that the meta continues to evolve and, uh, you know, play styles change and, and some players are improving just as Keen has so far. Um, this game, we have him kind of going back to what worked, at least uh, in a broader sense, with a third command center being made back at home. Um, he, it seems like Keen likes this on these big maps uh, to just get a third command center and, and make the, the Zerg guess versus going for, for command center first and then making the Zerg guess. Um, and, and this allows him to kind of bulk up uh, after the third CC is made in his main, land that um, when it's time, when he thinks it's, it's you know, going to be the appropriate moment. And Zerg just doesn't know what's going on. No, this Overlord positioning a little bit unfortunate there if he had come in. Closer to the top side, perhaps he would have been able to glimpse the command center, but I mean that's part of the game here as Solar, right. right? You have limited information. You don't know where exactly you can scout. You can only you can only spare so many hit points on that Overlord. So Solar, as of yet, still in the dark. Four Hellion drop will be the opening harassment of choice here. As Solar with the Zergling scout will get a little bit more of an inkling of what's going on here. And Tasteless, these four Hellions coming in. Let's see if Solar can react in time. Only nine Lings on the field. Yeah, the drones are running. Oh, they're so Ooh. lined up. He picks them up and actually comes over. Yep. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think he just <laughs> wants to try to drop right on top of the drones. Keen is so crazy in this game. Yeah, Keen's trying to micro this medevac like it's a warp prism uh, right It's crazy. <laughs> uh, he does more damage, but ultimately it fails. He does not get more kills, and the medevac falls. I missed that. Did the drone count? Did that get reset, or was it only three in total? That it was, was only three that? in total. Mm, yeah, you you want more than that from Four Hellions, especially catching Solar a little bit out of position there. So, bit of a painful opening here for Keen, but I mean he has proved to be resilient in late game and the middle game overall so far today in a variety of different matchups. So, don't write him off just yet. Even though that Hellion harassment didn't go his way. I mean, keep in mind, in game number one, a lot of the early drops didn't go his way either, and he was still able to make the pendulum swing back in his favor heading into the middle game as, you know, he's going back to his roots here. That third commander going to get planted over down at the third base. 1-1 one, one in production, combat shields as well, and I'm guaranteeing you, once those upgrades complete, that's when he's really going to turn the pressure on. Yeah. Um, but, again, that, that failed uh, uh, Hellion drop, I don't want to, like, and hammer on it too hard because it's like, yeah, well, it's either going to work or it's not going to work. You're just trying right. to find some kind of an opportunity to do some damage here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't really get that much. Uh, and so we move forward in this game uh, where it's going to be down to those upgrades finishing for Terran, oh. a eventually a push coming through. Uh, for now, he could try to sweep and take out these uh, tumors. That was a ton of creep tumors that you just killed. Yeah. <laughs> There's all seven of them. As uh, Solar with a little bit of a counter attack right here coming into the third base of Keen. He's going to pick off four SCVs, so already doing better than that Hellion drop did for Keen earlier in the game. As uh, for Keen, if he wants to try and get the momentum going once these upgrades kick in, it's going to be critical that he keeps these units active on the map and continues to control the creep spread as he did earlier in this game because you know you want to deny Zerg not only the mobility that the creep spread gives, but the vision so that you have a little bit more of an opportunity to come in from different angles and get big damage done. Yeah, you want to keep them guessing. 1-1's uh, one done, and so is Combat Shields. Let's see if Terran's going to move out uh, in a little bit here. Zerg is going to be ready. There uh, are a lot of roaches being made here. Their 1-1 one -one is also not that far behind. Zerg has really cranked up the supply, but again, a lot of this is in roach. Um, yeah, so it can be a little bit misleading uh, uh, as far as who's in what position. But we've seen this from Solar before where he likes to get a lot of Roach Ravager and try to take the Terran head on, use the corrosive vials to snipe the tanks, use the Roaches to try to um, just come in and topple the uh, Marines. But look at this drop. Solar just in a bad position here. He could end up losing this hatchery basically for free. And yeah, this hatchery in a precarious position, but Solar is almost going all in with this attack right now. Oh Another counterattack here at the third base of Solar going to take down some drones, but the main story here is this massive Roach Ravager attack 
at the natural here of Keen. Solar ballooning at 190 supply. Very few drones back at home, so he has to get damage done here, Tasteless. There's even a drop going on in the main. Meanwhile, it's just a question of whether or not uh, Keen can hold off this attack in the front. The damage beginning to spike up over here. Yeah, Keen's doing a good job of delivering some counter damage, but overall, Solar's getting the better trade. 20 SCVs in total going down 72 to 47 workers as the pressure mounts here. Keen's gonna have to evacuate this section of the map if he wants to hold on. And I'm really liking this decision by Solar to go for this timing attack. It feels like he's in a great position right now. It, it was so smart. He just understood that it's it's okay to ignore this. It's 72 workers to 46 with the Zerg in the lead. So this is a massive uh, 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 amount to be ahead. And although we saw the hatchery almost get killed and we did see the push up into the uh, the third base for the Zerg, the reality is didn't really, did not kill a hatchery for one. It did not kill anywhere near enough workers. Terran lost 20 workers just trying to control the ramp up into their natural. And I think that Solar can actually come up and set up the killing blow now. Yeah, despite Keen making that nice move to go down and snipe those expensive Ravagers off creep, I still feel like Solar might just have enough to power through. And you see right there on the units tab, more links in production. Plus two Carapace underway, plus one melee attack on the way. He knows that this is his game to lose right now. He's not going to let Keen take another third expansion. He's just going to set up this soft contain. And he might even be feeling confident enough to actually push up that ramp soon. Yeah, and the truth is, even if he can't push up the ramp, Terran has to eventually push down the ramp because Terran can't get a second base. But um, it, it may be a little bit too dangerous to try to come up there with the arc that is ready, especially with 2-2 finishing here. Um, and so he backs up. I think there's no reason to try to force a victory now from Solar's perspective. Instead, he says, you need to expand. You need to kind of come out on the map. And that means you're going to end up setting up a position I could probably attack it once more. Yeah, even with the added efficiency of mules right now, Solar's at almost triple the mineral income here of Keen, just flexing his economic muscle as Keen's struggling to resaturate this third and fourth base. I mean, he has the command centers. He just frankly doesn't have the army size to control them, but now's his time to start moving across the map. This is one of those moments where Keen might actually be able to start swinging things a little bit in his favor with some good engagements if he's able to take a good fight to Solar off creep. This is a large bio ball, and bio balls, they scale a lot better than Zerg armies like this one. This is a funny moment. He oh! just picks everything up. Yeah, this is a key moment right now. Keen coming into the main base here of Solar. There's a lot of critical tech right here. And keep in mind that there isn't a lot of anti-air. So if this doesn't go his way, he might pick up and move yet again to another base. Well, he's targeted some of the medevacs here with the Queens. Uh, it, it, you know, it is a, kind of a, a single file line of Zerg units coming up, but eventually there's just not enough over here um, for the Terran to try to take this. And now he can get sandwiched. The medevacs are, you know, they're still able to scoop up, but there's really not much Terran left on the ground here. Yeah, a lot of that army was lost, but he was able to trade some of it cost efficiently. Was able to kill a couple drones as well, so all hope is not lost. There might be a light here for the at the end of the tunnel for Keen if he's able to get the ball rolling a little bit harder. I mean, Solar, his drone count is extremely high. It is at 80, which does surpass Keen right now, but now that Keen is fully saturating these bases, if he can keep Solar on his side of the map and keep cost efficient trades like this one, there is a path to victory here. Yeah, he has chased this back out. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're starting to see the drops. I mean, they're, they're kind of becoming sparse. You know, Ling's alone can basically force the rest of this to be picked up. The Zerg uh, has hung on, but the reality is also that Keen is basically double expanded now. He's on four bases. He's continuing to push. The Zerg has really been trying to juggle too many tasks back at home. Um, and this big distraction has kind of paid off long term. It seems like Keen is back in this game. Yeah, for the past couple of minutes, Keen, he's been doing all these attacks and none of them have been going truly wondrously for him. But notice that during all these attacks, Solar is not counterattacking Keen at all. So he's been able to actually really rebuild his economy back up at home. And he's keeping Solar on Solar's side of the map and oh, losing Vipers like this. Full energy Vipers, you do not want to be losing them here as Solar is. Keen's continuing to press on and man, Tasis, I don't know how he does it. He just has so many units. It's almost confusing to watch how good he is. It just sort of uh, fighting back and bouncing back. You can see that mechanically, Keen has really worked on himself quite a bit. Uh, he is able to produce, he's able to macro and continue to micro around. Um, it almost looks like Vion from the other day, you know, it where he's, does. Just, he's, he's just persevering through everything. 
getting flashbacks to Byun's game three yeah. right now with the way that Keen is playing. Just slowly picking Solar apart and keeping Solar on his side of the map as Solar, despite his superior economy, he's been losing a lot of momentum. And part of that is because Bio does scale better in these situations, but also it's just been Keen's fantastic multitasking. He's not been letting up on the pressure at all. But this is a critical junction of the map right here, Tasteless. He does not want to let Solar get this base up. Solar's going to try and go for the flank. There's oh a lot of God. little mines. Watch this flash damage, though. Well, he does force this away. It's a lot of Widow Mines taken out. But can he actually take this all the way back to a base? I don't think so. It seems like Keen has really stayed on top of uh, the keep up game with Supply. Now, Keen's done a fantastic job of stabilizing back at home. And now, Solar finally coming through with these counter attacks. I feel like this has been the missing piece of the puzzle for him for the past couple of minutes. As the third and fourth base for Keen, although they have been rally points, have been largely undefended. And you see it right now on your screen. A lot of SCV is going down. This opportunity has been open here for Solar for a while, but the pressure from Keen has just been mounting and mounting. So he hasn't been able to do anything about it until this moment. And now, Taze's ultras are out. Let's see if Solar can push him out. Yeah, I, 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 for Solar's sake, I'm glad he was able to set some links up there for the counterattack. Better that than you know, nothing at all. And now, um, well, we're going to see the uh, medevacs get chased back out. I was going to say that, you know, now with this command center landing, it's going to be a Terran on uh, four bases again. But there's actually the chance that Zerk can just counterattack in this moment. And it does look like the supplies are a little bit shaky here for Keen. Yeah, these past couple of trades not going Keen's way as Solar now finally able to leverage that lead that he has wow. into a victory. Keen fought on until the bitter end there in a valiant effort, but it will be Solar advancing to the final match here in Group B. Look at the doggo. To face, to face One doggo. <laughs> Spin the chair back around. I want to see the Move dog. Move the chair. I want to see the dog. <sighs> well, um, this goes to our final match now. Yeah. Um, Solar, hey. He's fighting back. He's looking good, but he's going to have to go up against Hero. I don't know what this is going to look like. Yeah, it should be a fantastic match to finish off Group B. And, man, got to give props to Keen coming in here in what is, frankly, a very stacked Group B yeah. to show up and have some great games, not only against Hero, but also against Solar. I mean, that was a 1-2 finish there in the series, and it felt very close from start to finish. Yeah. Um, look, it's sad to see Keen go, but the the truth is, is that Solar um, – I think he really adjusted whatever was going wrong with his play. It did seem like Solar was maybe tilted from the games from Cure. Maybe. And then, you know, Keen plays straight up, and he's like, oh, my God, I can't, you know. <laughs> can't catch a break. I can't catch a break here. Um, he did play a very good game. Keen, though, I love when he was on two bases, he actually managed to fight back to four. He was He's really able to kind of be a menace to the, uh, to, to the Zerg on the Zerg side of the map. The problem is, is it is this balancing act of – you, you want to be taking out units and trying to trade, and, and you uh, you unload from, you know, pushing at the third, you, uh, then you load up. I'm sorry, you load it from the third, you push into the main, you drop there, you go back out, you try to find another location. But you got to be careful because there was a moment, I think actually the moment that, that Solar won the game back there, it was when he sent the Lings up to the third base. Exactly. Killed everything, and then there was a couple more Lings that killed everything at the fourth. And then it was like, now none of your barracks are going to make for the next minute or two. Yeah, it was like the House of Cards just crumbled, and that yeah. was really what Keen was kind of sacrificing back at home to be able to move out on the map and exert that pressure there on Solar was, you know, he can't commit to defending these exterior bases. He just has to go full-on aggression and just pray that he can exert enough pressure to keep Solar on his side of the map, and it worked for a long time, but in the end, Solar was able to clean it up, and when we get back, our final match of the day here in Group B, Solar vs. Hero, we'll see you soon.
for a minute. Ka, 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 ta. Same one, zero one. Same one, shari chan girl. Tama shuro to, zero nari ko ya. Welcome back. It's time to have our closing match for Group B and see who will actually move on. Uh, Hero versus Solar. Remember that if Solar dies here, we have one more Zerg that, that could possibly move on to the round of eight. Yeah, we're only halfway through round of 16, and we yeah. might go down to only one Zerg. So we have a quick recap of the matches here today. Hero with a 2-0 victory over Keen. Did eventually lose to Cure there in the winner's match. And now Hero versus Solar, man. I'm excited. I think this should be a fun PBZ. And PBZs, they're going to be few and far between here yeah. at the GSL. Well, I mean, if the Zergs all go away, then we're going to get <laughs> the Zerg matchups out of the way very quickly. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know who to, to root for here. I mean, as a Protoss player myself, I kind of have always enjoyed Hero's uh, his plays. Uh, Protoss have performed the, the worst out of all the GSLs. Right. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, I do like having all three races in the round yeah. of eight, you know? Yeah, I'm a little torn, too. Hero is one of my favorite players to watch in the world, just by his pure skill. Yeah. And how good he is at leading the Protoss race it, over the past year and a half. But, I mean, Solar, one of the very few players keeping the Zerg lifeblood going here, the GSL Code S. All right, guys, we're going to go into the final best of three. Hero versus Solar. The winner survives to the round of eight. The loser is out of the first season of this year's GSL. DKZ Gaming, Hero. Onside Gaming, Solar. Such a good Little puppy sleeping over there on the left. Sleeping so in a little cute, dog bed. Man. Little dog beds everywhere. Oh, uh, wow. Whoa. This is, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's a dodo on this map. <laughs> I was so excited to see the dogs, I wasn't looking at the, the yeah, no, map on the, the preview screen. <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, is catching my surprise. It's a proxy two game. Well, what year is the year this? The year is 1998, and it's the first week of StarCraft One. Somewhere in Canada, Artosis is waking up in a cold yeah, sweat. Yeah, Artosis is screaming <laughs> in his sleep, <laughs> peeing in the bed right now. Oh, uh, this is sick. It's Two Gate Forge. Yeah, this is awesome. I haven't really seen too much of this in Legacy of the Void. Yeah, we had a lot of these old weird builds, and, and they're sometimes not. How do I say this? They're, they can be kind of obsolete cheeses. Yeah, this is certainly something that's a little bit obsolete. <laughs> Absolutely. But, I mean, here with this tournament life on the line, he's coming through with this in game number one. So certainly he believes this is something worth playing here. 
As the first pylon goes down, now Solar might just think he's bluffing. He only pulls yeah. one more drone. But it, once that pylon finishes, he's going to know. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is one of these moments where, like, I remember SOS especially doing this a lot, where he would, like, make a pylon and, like, people would overreact, and it's just like, nah. Now, the funny thing is that he doesn't really worry as much if this cannon finishes. Right. Because the Zealots are going to come up. And this is going to be a scary moment here for Solar. This is not the kind of situation you often find yourself preparing for. As that cannon actually will get up, Tasteless, the Zealots are this able to crazy. come in. Zone out those drones and... Yeah. I, I don't know the ins and outs on, on how you hold with this build. Like, I, I don't know exactly how this works, so I honestly just haven't casted it in a long time. It does seem like the Protoss is not intent on making more than four Zealots. And so this is just designed to kill the hatchery. And I, we see two gases. I'm sorry, he's going to make up to six Zealots. He's queuing up another one. I, I thought for sure he would stop it at that. Um, this is creative play coming out of here. I'm loving this opening. It's something you had seen Heart of the Swarm. And right now, I mean, Solar, he's building a Roach Warren. He's taking a gas. He's building Zerglings. He's doing everything he possibly can do to survive. But, you know, Tasteless, I think actually you were right. He canceled Zealots number five and oh, six. Oh, okay, he did. All right, all he right. He just had those going for a little bit of time, now getting Cybernetics Core back at home. And you got to think that probably the follow-up for for Hero, I would, I would think is going to be Stargate. I, yeah, I was wondering if he could go two gate stalker. Oh, that's also try to a fight the, the roaches, you know? Oh, it's so, so much fun trying to figure yeah. out exactly what you can do with something like this. Actually, Adepts, this is not what I oh, okay. expected. We're both wrong. We're what even a cool so far. Build. Oh, I'm loving this right now. It's such a treat to watch these games. Yeah. The, the cannon's taken out. You know, th there's really no unit that's worse than a slow zealot. Um, <laughs> So he makes the two adepts. Now this could probably Ooh. generate threats. Got the drone there. It wasn't uh, wasn't mineral walking all the way through. That's a nice pick up there for Hero. Stargate is underway. These two adepts potentially might be able to catch a couple more drones, and no, he will surely yeah. cancel that with that many lings. But I mean, as it is right now, worker advantage in Hero's favor. Hatchery only a little bit ahead of the Nexus here for Protoss. Does he, does he just make a Void Ray? No, he makes an Oracle, I guess, for the Lings. Yeah, going to be an Oracle. Also great at killing these Ravagers. Those Ravagers yeah. cannot go too far off creep. So it will allow him to keep you know these gateways alive for at least a longer period of time. Now that pylon probably will go down. But there is potential for Hero to come out with the probe and try and repopulate this. But maybe getting a little bit far ahead of myself. I'm just this trying to think of all no, the different no, no, ways it's, that you could play this out. It's, it's such so, an interesting position. It's so cool to see. Uh, he's going to actually come in here and probably force another egg. No, he's going to get both these eggs. This is actually kind of cool. Like, this is nice. I, I don't know how often uh, he gets to play with this, but now he can actually protect this. Yeah, the Ravager is dead if he decides to go for it. Actually, often kill the Lynx No, this here. is probably better to go for the Lynx, right? Yeah. I would have made a mistake. I would have gone yeah. for the Ravager. <laughs> That's why I'm not playing in the GSL taste list. <laughs> Why are it's higher you would have like gone for the Ravager, ago. and then the, and then the Lings come up and kill the pylon. You're like, no. Um, <laughs> all right, so here we're gonna. Oh, I was a little, I didn't see the shield battery for a second. I was like, why is he not going for the for the Zealot? Yeah, yeah. My, my brain's like on fire right now, just oh, trying to it's process everything. Crazy that can following this. I do feel like that Hero is starting to, to get a little bit further ahead here. The um, yeah. Oracles are gonna come back, so they're gonna go for probably the Ravager this time. All right. My um, redemption story here is that right. Ravager goes down. Um, so we're going to take a third base. Twilight Council will be the follow-up here for Hero as we are eventually going to normalize into a kind of recognizable position. I mean, if if, yeah. if I showed you this game right now and just there weren't the two gateways in the Forge on the map, you might think it's kind of normal, yeah. right? There's an Oracle flying around doing some harassment. There's Zerglings with speed. Protoss has their low ground expansion. And so we, we kind of go into a more standard position in a very weird way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's such a cool start. It's funny to see Hero open up with this. I mean, it is making um, Solar play a very different game. The Adept play may throw Solar off because a lot of times when you experience rushes like this from the Zerg's perspective, you feel like you're behind. Yeah. Even, even if maybe it's more even than it looks because it just feels like everything's gone wrong for you. Um, and so this may cause him to over drone, and then as he over drones, especially if, like you know the oracles are going to snipe more workers here, that he could get blindsided with a uh, glaive adepts pushing. So cool! It's kind of fun getting here because 
you don't really know exactly where you stand. Well, I mean, of course you know where you stand, but where you stand relative to your opponent, yeah. right? And so you have to really think on your feet and just try to play the best possible game you can as the Depths shading down to the third base. They want to secure that Nexus there, but unfortunately Oracle's a little bit late. Will result in two of these Depths going down. Yeah, but it seems like he wasn't looking when they, they shaded in there. Yeah, but it, it is just so cool the way that we arrived at this position. And you know, it kind of reminds me of Bobby Fischer in chess, how he would sometimes do these really crazy wonky openings because he hated how people had just memorized yeah. all of the most popular lines. It's like, okay, I want to do something completely offbeat, and then we're going to play pure raw chess yeah. where you have we're to think play on your a feet. weird game. Exactly. Let's see if you can actually figure this out or not. With every move, and that's kind of what it feels like right now with Hero and Solar, because I guarantee you this is kind of an awkward position for both of them. I mean, these adepts now coming in with Glaives able to pick off three drones. As, you know, Solar, he is pulling ahead a little bit in the worker count. He has been droning out quite heavily, up to 47 drones in total right now before starting Roach production. So he's in a pretty comfortable position, but I mean, it's just been such a shakeup here in the early game. But. How many gates are actually in this game right now? Um, we haven't really got a shot of the main, and I wasn't really looking. I don't know exactly. I, I would I would guess around three. That kind of seems like you know a nice stable number to try and do all these different branching techs as we see um you know blink coming in, disruptors coming in, warp prism speed coming in, in addition to these three oracles. So yeah, I'm not sure exactly where the gateway count lies, but it seems like Hero is kind of focusing on having a more technical army here. I mean. Certainly going for three oracles into speed, warp prism, disruptor. It's yeah, I mean, he's he's the gateways are going to be filling in at the very, very end. Yeah, um, that's not the priority here. A lot of workers killed with those oracles. Like, really impressive stuff. Uh, the Zerg is taking the fourth. The third is already uh, being mined from. And there's going to be another harass come in here with these disruptors. I, I think that he should be safe from Roach uh, Ling, but I'm not sure exactly what's at the third base right now. Yeah, we'll see exactly what is set up here. Actually, not too many units, but with the shield battery, should be able to hold on. Actually, hold that thought. Is looking at the minimap. There's a lot of lings and roaches coming down in the south position as well. So these disruptors are going to come home. Try and shore up the defense here. And Solar, I don't think he knows exactly what is in that warp prism, but he knows it's not good. So <laughs> he sees it come back home and retreats a little bit. And um, the Bainling's Nest is going to come down now. I do feel like this is actually a little bit better for Hero. I actually feel like it might be a little bit better for Solar, which, I mean, just goes to show how dynamic this game position is, right? Where, I mean, we both have God yeah. view, and it's hard for us to tell and gauge, really. Yeah, we, we have the like, uh, omnipotence here in this game and can kind of follow everything, but it just seems to me like this is going to set up for a really healthy push, especially if you can just keep hitting some stuff with disruptor shots. I'm just a little bit worried about the fragility of the army that Hero was building. I mean, he, he did go, I think, three or four, okay, three disruptors with three oracles, and now going into Colossus. Those are a lot of high-tech units that don't pack the biggest punch if they aren't used to perfection, the disruptors especially. And I don't know if Solar is going to go for a big flood of units. And this Ling actually coming in here and getting a scout is quite nice for Solar. But back to my point, if Solar comes in with a really big timing attack once these three Vipers pop and get energy, it might be a point of weakness there for Hero. But I do think if we get into more of a late game situation, Hero will have the edge considering how rapidly he's been able to fill out his tech tree. Yeah, you could be right about that. You know, we never quite seen a game develop like this because the start is so weird. Yeah. I mean, the harass has been pretty good, to be honest, from uh, Hero, especially with the Oracles killing off those workers. Um, but you're right. It, a Solar might be wound up so tight that he actually can't get busted. Um, he's, you know, seeming to be unfazed by this endless um, disruptor harass. Eventually does clean up those Oracles. All three now have gone down. There's the Protoss' fourth base. So it's a very, very delayed push. It's like a crazy rush into a lot of harass into like, I'm going to get all the bases I need for this matchup for the time being. Yeah, just playing very conservatively back at home as Hero, just putting a lot of focus on really messing Solar up with, you know, light harassment plays like the speed disruptors, the three oracles. And now he's getting enough of a stalker count up that he can start to chuck around the map a little bit. Shore up his defense back at home with the Colossus and these Disruptors. And now I think he's gonna, just going to be mixing in some Archons with these High Templar now that Charge is underway. But Charge only about, I think, 33% of the way done. So this can be a scary moment. 
Yeah, he's going to try to come back over here. I don't think that's enough to actually break in. We no. are getting to the supply point where, like, Berserk should be attacking and then trying to do some damage. I think your earlier analysis might be right. Hero might actually just be safe here to continue powering up and filling out his deck tree back at home. I mean, this army does look quite strong here for Solar, but he's going to need a very good engagement to actually topple the defenses that Hero is building back at home. Yeah, well, there's not a real easy opening to get into, right? I mean, that's one of the problems. It seems like there's only two two areas of, of, of entry, and, and you know he's basically ready to fight at both oh. of those. Nice feedbacks there on those Vipers. There's only a couple of abilities come in. Disruptor Shot gonna have to be big here. Coming in, Solar with a nice Ooh. split, mitigating a lot of the damage, but you know, behind all of this, that shield battery's been shoring up the defense here for Hero at the third base. Not a lot of hit points lost on these units, so although he was able to kind of deactivate the Disruptors there in that engagement, the rest of Hero's army pulled through. Really good blinking over here. Uh, he does chase him out. But this is the moment where we usually see the Zerg then power back up, make a lot more lings, start to make some more Bane lings, and try to come in and crash into the Protoss. Uh, when they're basically weakened up, it takes the Protoss a little bit longer to fill up the supply. They don't have that larva mechanic that the Zerg can uh, exploit in some of these games to try to come out comfortably. Uh, we also see that there's actually not the full amount of probes mining over here. Disruptor Harass is going <laughs> to... He's not going to do it. There's only three drones there. Yeah, it's not really worth No. Just trying to find some value here, but I think he's going to quickly identify the situation and try and bring that disruptor back home as there's a solar coming in for another big attack. Uh, and as we can see here, this is going to be a lot for Hero. He's going to have to eat a lot of Baneling connects. Yeah, nice. Blinks right there to try and disrupt the damage coming in. Disruptor itself actually getting abducted, so really no connections from the disruptors here in this fight as this one's going much better in Solar's way. His Viper usage has been fantastic so far as Hero, he might be able to stabilize here with a couple more warp ins, but, you know, Solar's been doing a great job of kind of resetting the critical unit count, and yeah, Hero will eventually push him away, but Solar on 76 supply, or 76 supply, excuse me, 76 drones yeah. will be able to rebuild his supply quite rapidly here. I just don't know if there's going to be counterplay here. I see an Immortal and a Templar. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. It, it just feels like he's going to try this, but I don't see what the rationale would be. I mean, is he really going to be able to actually come in here and break this? The Stalkers are doing an okay job. He's actually doing a good job not overextending and just bleeding off all of the uh, the Zealots, but the Banelings are going to come forward here. Yep, Banelings coming in, trying to connect with these Stalkers, but they blink away yet again. Luckily for them, able to clean up the Zealots at the very least is the Disruptor now coming in. We'll have to settle for... One Ravager and one Queen as Hero's going to blink away. And you know, one important thing to note, and perhaps this is factoring into Hero's decision to try and push so heavily here with Gateway Units, is if Solar decides to remax on Lings, it's not really going to go his way. He doesn't really have any Carapace upgrades at all on the board, if I'm not mistaken. So these Zealots are just going to absolutely shred through any Ling remaxes that um, Solar might come out with. So yeah, unless it's just going to be Roaches and Ravagers here for Solar, which I mean, he continuously adds in these Lings, it's going to be difficult for him. He's going to have to dispatch those Zealots with Banelings to the best of his ability. Otherwise, they're just going to shred. You know, it, it's um, it's been a very, very tricky situation for Protoss. We've casted many games like this before, and I'm always a little bit confused about how to handle it. It's like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. When yeah. the Zerg has been beating you down, it's like, well, you, you push out, you die. Okay, you look like a fool. You turtle, then you die later on, and you look like a fool. I mean, I think it's one of the reasons why so many games people try to focus on some kind of way to trip the zerg up because this phase of the game can be a very difficult one right when they're basically hitting the supply ceiling but the income is still pretty good and the other race is trying to catch up size storm now done here for hero as with some nice feedbacks and size storms was able to deflect that attack there from the third base but 16 probes killed man yeah these mainly counter attacks getting a lot of economic damage done here all the way down to 57 drones is solar continues to push in here it's a tough position to break. Hero's doing a good job of holding on, at least for now, but it feels like after all these trades, the critical unit count gets reset for Hero and Solar. Oh my goodness, again with the Banelings coming in. 25 probes now. He's going to get even more. These are plus two upgraded Banelings. They just obliterate probes, one-shotting them. Hero, I mean, he basically has to go in all, in all in at this point, right? I think he has to. I don't know that it's going to work. I'm very worried. Now, that was a lot of Banelings that were spent back there. 
um, in order to destroy all these workers. So he's not going to have as many banelings in the actual fight to defend himself. If they can get, to, uh, if basically the banelings can be prevented from connecting ideally to their targets. Uh, and Hero could trade really efficiently, maybe. Oh. He's actually pushing on top of banelings right now that are about to hatch, which means he could deny some of them from uh, coming out and therefore being used at all. He does destroy one hatchery as well. Archon's in the front taking a lot of damage right now. War Prism gets abducted. That will get sniped there by the Queen. So reinforcements are going to be hard to find here for a hero, but he's continuing to push forward. He knows that he has to win right here, right now. His work count all the way down at 32. And so far, Chases, he's doing a good job, but there might be just enough here for Solar to hold on. Even drones entering the fray. Yeah, drones coming forward to try to help out in the fight. Just the Archon and the Immortal over here. Uh, doing a decent amount of damage, but I'm still seeing a few units trail up and no reinforcements here for the Protoss. I think Hero is probably out of this game. Yeah, it's coming down to the wire, but at the end, Solar's going to take it with some fantastic harassment there. So many probe kills at the third and fourth base there for yeah. Hero and just relentless attacks into that position. And one of the more entertaining PBZs that we've had so far. Really fun opening from Hero. I love what I see. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a reason why we don't have that specific cheese used all the time. Like, I guess you do get guaranteed to get a hatchery, uh, or almost guaranteed to get a hatchery. But then you have two gates in the middle of the map. You don't have tech that you can follow up with easily. You're basically both playing a very dicey uh, one base versus one base game. And that's not ideal for anybody, but at least the Zerg has all their stuff back at home. Um, and, and from there, even with really good harass from Hero... Solar just droned up and, and got to where, you know, every Zerg is trying to get if they're going to play a macro game where they were maxing out. They were able to slam into those bases over and over and over uh, yeah. and come through victorious. I, I feel like in a situation like that, it is so hard for Zerg to navigate exactly how to defend that kind of pressure because, I mean, right from the gate, it's such an awkward position. I mean, there's two gateways in a forge right outside your base. There's a cannon or a natural. You lose your natural hatchery. It's complete chaos, but Solar just with killer instinct there, able to weather the storm to perfection and eke out every single possible drone he could on top of that is going to come away with set number one on Babylon. So Hero now fighting for his tournament life here in Group B. He might be the second player eliminated in the round of 16 Group B. Let's go to set number two on altitude. My nose is already bleeding. <laughs> DKZ Gaming, Hero. What is that in like this fishbowl thing that he's got? Yeah, the it's top like he left. has like, it's like a crystal. Is. Yeah. Is look it, look at the picture like of Solar, by the way. He's got like a spike coming gaming. out of his back. Solar. Yeah, he's like that. a little Baneling. He is Zerg. He is the Zerg, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what that is in Hero's room. Looks like a pylon almost. It's like a pylon that hasn't been sculpted into like the yeah, power. Yeah, it's the like power warping bearing. in right now, but it's <laughs> not. Not everything's done uh, over there yet. Oh, um, all right. Well, let's see what happens this game. No extremely early gateway shenanigans coming out of here this time. Just low ground gateway at the natural expansion. Pro block coming in, but I mean, in the year 2023, it's about as standard as it gets. I mean, Zergs are so used to taking that third base is effectively their natural at this point that it's yeah. almost. Uh, point. It's just kind of the way the game goes, you know? Yeah. You know, this was exciting stuff in the first couple of days. Like, oh, that's, you know, what does that mean? And I mean, maybe it means something later on in a push, but usually not. I think also you want to try to get in, especially if you're going for a gateway expand and just make sure there's not some crazy cheese coming. Yeah. And I think Solar of all Zergs is probably one of the most comfortable ones in taking that forward base, considering how he tends to like playing a little bit more aggressively, especially in this matchup with, you know, Roaches and Ravagers and Lings. So, yeah, he likes to basically try to take like a fighting Zerg stance and, and try to just kind of take the other player head on um, and, and box him around and, and then, you know, fight back from there. So this is an expanding build. You know, I, I, I like Hero doing that weird build in that first game. It's very fun. But then when it fails, you go, oh, man, are you going to get eliminated because of this? Yeah. You know, like, is this because... I, I think build order randomization is very important, but you only have two more Zergs left in this GSL. Well, maybe it was something that has been working for him a lot in practice the first time that somebody sees it, right? You know, it doesn't have to be a completely solid strategy to be valid to use one time in a best of three. If this was the first time that Solar has seen it, which we don't know if it was. Right. 
it could be the kind of thing that, you know, it's a one and done. You see it one time, it catches you off guard. Perhaps you overreact there as the Zerg. You lose the game, and right. Hero's up 1-0. So I like it. I, I like him rolling the dice there. It, it didn't quite turn out the way that, you know, he would have hoped for, but it was a fantastic game. And, you know, Solar just messed up a little tiny bit. I mean, we would be praising Hero for... You know, yeah, well, we would be like singing his, you know, <laughs> yeah, singing his hymns right now. That, you know, he's he's done it. He's such a genius. Oh my god, um, but you know, all these cheeses are not all created equally, um, and I think that really was him. Like, he's pretty much 100 percent sure he'll get the hatchery, but it's like, do you know how to deal with this? Do you know how to actually play this game out from here? Mm -hmm. I think maybe a lot of other Zergs go too aggro off of that. And then they, you know, they, they either die to the harass or get weakened up to the harass or, or they overextend and try to take out the other player's natural. But he basically played an extremely patient game back there. Huh. Kind of an interesting build here coming out of Hero. I was expecting to see a Stargate again here in game number two, but instead it's Fourgate Robo. He has a Twilight Council only Glaives. just now starting Glaives. One of the classics, man. We've seen this before. Very early Glaives pressure. Um... I don't feel like it's that strong. Yeah, the, the build is shaken up a little bit from the way that I normally see it. Uh, maybe this is slightly more optimized with him getting glaives after the gateways and the robo. Perhaps he just like funnels all of his chrono boosts into that and he's able to eke out a faster timing or something. But yeah, yeah it is just going to be a four gate glaives pressure opening. So nothing too crazy there is the warp prism. Let's move out on the map. And this is something that, you know, every Protoss player. Probably a lot of Protoss players also at home, and every Zerg player definitely at home has played against dozens and dozens and dozens of times. One of the more standard builds, but you know, oftentimes this usually doesn't go Protoss's way. It, you know, it, it it was used a lot, and I think it just it, it, it the build it exhausted itself because I think Protoss has became too reliant on trying to make different adept builds work. Now, what we want to watch for is see, you know, does he keep making any probes during this or not? Because I just would be surprised if this was... Oh, and he's going to commit in here. I yeah, will commit, but, you know, being able to use this left side of the natural expansion as kind of a barrier here prevents Solar from going in for the surround because, you know, Solar, if he loses all of his lings, that's pretty much the game. And actually, a little bit of a missed up there is Solar going to have to vacate this. This is a lot of mining time lost and actually kind of surprised that Hero didn't try to get back in there and harass the drones again. Instead, they're going to come in here to the natural, but... Not this enough surface area there for the Lings. This is starting to snowball a bit. Yeah, you know, if you can get, like, two or three good moves with the Adepts and, like, kill workers and then move somewhere where the Lings are not, it's usually a good sign. Um, now, this isn't an all-in, by the way. There's a Nexus being made. There's an Immortal being made. I don't think there were probes being made, but that can wait a little bit. And, you know, with the Immortal out, w where is the Immortal? I guess it's just back at home? Um, I think this might actually be the first Immortal as actually Solar coming in here to the natural expansion. Oh no, correct me, yeah, it's right here at the ramp along with these adepts, so. So we're actually gonna lose a lot of links there. I don't know if that was premeditated by Hero, but in any case, he gets the better end of that trade with Solar coming up the ramp. It looked like it was gonna be really bad when we saw the links get in. Just in general, like, you know, in easy calls, you see links get inside their natural, you're like, oh boy, you know, how much stuff is gonna be killed, but it seems like he's okay. Now he's gonna commit to this push. And um, I don't know that this Nexus is ever, maybe he's just, using this as kind of a red herring. I think there it is. There hasn't been probes being made. I, I guess this is a build where you like have 400 extra minerals and that's gonna maybe make the Zerg be greedy. And now we have Immortals and uh, Adepts pushing. Yeah, this hurts though right here in the main base. Oh. These Lings are getting a lot of damage in on those probes. Six going down and this is what we've all been building for. A lot of Adepts and Immortals now coming in. Do or die here for a hero. Elimination match. Ling and Roach is also coming in, trying to get the flood. Ling's got a nice surround right there. A lot of surface area on those Adepts, but Will Hero have enough to fight back? Uh, he is warping in four more Adepts. He doesn't have mm. that much more money behind this. The Queens are a little bit low. It looks like some are going to be picked off here as they stay out in the front. This feels like a, a mistake here by Solar to have this out here. It does feel like a little bit of a misstep there with two Queens falling. And now this third base is going to have to get vacated there by the drones, at least for a moment. As Solar trying his best to stay on top of where these Adepts might go is actually the Adept Shade is going to get canceled. So now... Yeah. Hero zeroing in on this one location. Another big counterattack in his natural base, though. Yeah, he's doing a really good job with these adepts, basically forcing the lings away. And then the uh, immortal and the uh, immortals, I should say, and the adepts can be picked off. But 
There's 15 more workers being killed. There's actually not mining half. There's, sorry, that's what he says. He's not mining right now. He's moving probes in between this, which means like, as long as the Zerg has anything and he can kind of stabilize here, he might be able to hold this off. That's a lot of damage on those Immortals. That might cost him the whole push. Yeah, those Immortals are very low on HP right now. These Adepts trying to find more drone damage right now as both players actually dip below 30 worker supply. And I mean, more league attacks coming in. I can see on the mini map, there was a counter attack over here at Hero's third bases. Hero was absolutely planning on this being a completely committed three base all in. I don't know if that is still the game plan. We'll have to see if he, it looks like it is. <laughs> no more probes in production. I thought he might try to take a step back after losing so much HP on those immortals, but I mean, I think I think it's it's now or Ooh. never. I mean, it, it's really these two immortals. He comes up here. He he drives the workers away because they were mining at the third. We've had probes like basically shift in between all these spots. Same as the uh, the drones here for the Zerg. It looks like it's Groundhog's Day with the same attack coming forward here this time. It is three immortals instead oh. of just two, and a really good uh, adept shade comes in. Is there enough lings to thin this number out? The yeah. Adepts are starting to drop. The Adept count is falling here. Four more getting warped in, but the three Immortals are standing strong. Oh. They've been focus firing Roaches this entire time, and suddenly there isn't a lot of army supply for Solar, but the counterattack yet again. Hero might have very little mining, if any, at the end of this. Yeah, Hero, uh, the Lings are going to come through here now. There's only 16 workers. There is a Spore up here. Uh, he's starting to hit some of these uh, Immortals back here. They're being juggled. Drones are being pulled. I think that actually Solar is going to lose this game. He might, man. I don't know. It's so close right now. Keep in mind that Hero is only on three probes, so he has to make it happen right now with just oh, these zero three workers immortals. now. Zero workers. Zero workers here for Hero. Oh my God. Uh, there's 20 drones mining right now for Solar. I think he's going to be able to build enough units to actually stabilize here. There is no mining happening for Hero. These immortals are not going to be enough. Oh! He pulls away. I mean, there's got to be it, no way, right? I think it's impossible. He needs to make a queen or two. He needs to get some something that can actually hit. Um, well, hold on. There's a spore right here. I think Solar's done. I it. think he's done. Yeah, there, there's no way these immortals. I mean, even if they I were maxed. No, no. HP, I mean, Hero's done. Solar's got this. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I mean, man, what a close game, though. What a tough way to go out here for Hero. He just needs to get a queen out and chase this down. Again, zero mining here. God. And you can see Solar's just, he's like, all right, am I sure that he doesn't have anything here? And he's like, okay, he's not, he just has no probes here. Yeah, I mean. Oh God, I think we're gonna, yep, that's it, GG, whoa. What a game. What a game, dude. Why are we ending with the greatest games of all time? That was so fun to cast. Yeah, that was absolutely wild. And Hero gave it his absolute all there. Fighting to the very last with just two Immortals and a Warp Prism, trying his best to survive. But at the end of the day, I mean, you have no income at all, and things are not going to go your way. I mean, Solar right. just had to survive right there. That was crazy. Crazy game back there. Solar wins 2-0, two very different games. Uh, I actually think the, the push idea from Hero was actually a pretty original take uh, on the Adept style. Um, he has that Nexus making, but really it's about the Immortals. And... Once the, th the rush isn't really working, I, did he even go back and make probes? He might have just moved probes to mine at the third when the Lings got in with the counterattack. I think that's exactly what it was. Yeah. He was trying to ferry those probes to a safe location, which at that time was the third base. But, you know, Solar with those relentless counterattacks with the Lings, I think, if he didn't make those plays, Holer, pro uh, Holer oh my God, Hero probably wins game two. Yeah. And we're going to a, a match point game three right now. But instead, Solar just with sick game sense just continuously attacking there. It does not give Hero any breathing room. And that's going to be Hero going out in the round of 16. Zerg hopes are alive. Yeah, we got one more Zerg moving on. Hero's gone. That's a bit of a bummer. I think a lot of people expected him to perform very well. Uh, it's very important you pick the right builds in these group stages. You know, I know it's like right at the start of GSL. We are in the round of 16. We did minimize oh, the number of players in the tournament. Um, anyways, uh, congratulations to Solar. You showed tremendous performance against Hero. Did you see his two gates on the map in game one? Hero used to use that build a lot on the ladder, so I had lost against him several times with that specific build. I put a lot of thought into how exactly I can hold that. So I knew it was coming when I saw it. 
and I had some ideas on how to prepare for that. Second match, you sent Zerglings here and there, and it seems like that's what allowed you to get that victory. When did you identify that? <laughs> when I killed all his probes. When I saw just the prisms and the two immortals, and I thought, oh my gosh. I was wondering why he's not typing GG. So I thought, oh god, is there something else going on in this game? Is there some secret in this game I haven't figured out? Yeah, he did a lot of damage to you uh, in that push. My micro was a little sloppy in the first match. I felt like my hands weren't quite warmed up enough. Oh, he's talking of, uh, uh, he asked this question to Bion. I see you have dogs in the house. Yes, I've got three pet coaches in the house. Are the coaches satisfied with your performance? Yes, I want to thank my coaches. Even when I lose my games, they comfort me. So he wants to thank his pet coaches for helping him. There are a lot of fans who are eager to see you win this season. Any words for them? So recently when I prepared the round of 16, I wasn't really satisfied with my performance. I had a lot of different things I had to worry about, so my preparation wasn't good enough. But I'm ready this time, and I'm, I'm excited to work hard. Uh, please keep cheering for me. All right, that's the interview. Very cool. Those are the casters, yeah, also that's... in chains. <laughs> We're all tied up here. Do we have bigger chains than them? Do we? We might. We better. <laughs> Got to tell our production team to increase the size. My contract the size for the year. I'm like, chains. I'll cast for those Korean guys, but only if I have the bigger chains <laughs> behind me. Uh, um, well, you know, kind of a little bit of an upset. I mean, Kira and Solar absolutely yeah. have the skill to go to the round of eight of any single GSL, but the fact that Hero is not advancing here is honestly a surprise to me. I mean, I am a Hero fanboy, so I'm a little bit biased here, but I was expecting him to walk away with the first in this group. Yeah, I mean, he's played so, so well. I, I thought for sure, um, for sure he would move on, yeah. yeah um, but Kira, I mean, you know, he's a killer. And, and, and in, in a season where we have... Not that many Zergs. The fact that he's so good at uh, TVP will probably prove to be extremely valuable. Yep, and so we get a quick recap over here. Hero winning the first match of the day against Keen. Kira defeating Solar 2-0. And then in the winner's match, Kira defeating Hero with a nice 2-0, securing him the round of eight spot. Solar beat Keen, the elimination match, and then Solar rounding things out with a win there against Hero in two very entertaining games, I have to say. I mean, that was a 2-0 on paper, but I love that build we saw from Hero in game number one, and then in game number two, I mean, what a what a fantastic finish there. Just Solar hanging on by a thread to clutch out the top eight. We're going to be back on Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. KST with Dark, Stats, Ryung, and Gumiho. Should be another fun group. Excited to see Stats play. Dark, the only other Zerg remaining in this tournament right now, hopefully will be trying to join Solar in the round of eight. Yeah, you know, his stats um, being back, and I really want to see exactly where he's at. Um, you know, Ryung's been with us for a long time, as with Dark and, and Gumiho. Gumiho's looked extremely strong lately. Um, I think it's a tough group to call, other than I think Dark is supposed to get out of this group first, no matter what. Yeah, I would be surprised if Dark didn't make it. So, you know, if unless we have some insane upsets there next Tuesday, we, we should have Dark probably in the round of eight, joining with Solar and... Well, yeah. Two Zergs in a round of eight, that's, that's a pretty reasonable spread compared to, I mean, today we almost went down to one Zerg, you know, when we're halfway through the round of 16, which would have been absurd. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am a little bit relieved that we have at least some Zerg presence here. Because if we get to, like, the round of four and it's no Zergs, it's like, ah, uh, you know. Yeah, ideally you want to have at least one of every race, you know, yeah. heading into the top four. Yeah, it makes exactly. makes the games the most dynamic and the most fun. Well, everybody, you know, if, if they play a specific race, they're going to have somebody to cheer for and to follow and to try to learn from. Um, but, yeah, I mean, another great day uh, of games. I got to say, another crazy ending. 
um, for that. Um, with that, you know, those final moments where Solar actually comes out after killing all those probes. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back on Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. KST. We love you, and uh, we'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.